I didn't choose the scene. The scene chose me. Rawr. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today, we've got some brief international drag news to cover, including some drama between India Farah and Miss Fierce Alicious. Then we'll be grabbing our frequent flyer punch cards to take our third trip across the pond in just 12 short months. You okay, hon? I know I'm not. 10 months ago, we got crystallized with Crystal Versace crowning her the winner of season three. Six months ago, we crowned Blue Eyed Dranger the queen of the world after winning RuPaul's Drag Race UK versus the world. And today we're going back, 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 back again for RuPaul's Drag Race UK season Season four. And Miss RuPaul is back, 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 back again in the World of Wonder green screen basement wearing her white up due to announce the cast. Some things never change. First up, hallelujah, we've got some fun news. Them.us has an article out reporting Shangela will be the first Drag Race contestant to appear on Dancing with the Stars. Well, the American version, that is. Courtney Act, of course, did the Australian version a couple years ago. Her dance partner will be Gleev Savchenko, apparently his 10th overall season on the series. And Miss Shandy will be competing against the likes of Charlie D'Amelio, which should be interesting. I have literally no idea how that show works, by the way, but if anyone could get me to watch a show, it's Miss Shanji. So an extra big hallelujah and congrats to Shangela. Now let's touch base in Canada. Miss Fierce Alicious found herself in the middle of some drama a couple of days ago when she was sabotaged by one of the fans in a live stream she was doing. Someone falsely, I will preface this with, wrote to Miss Fierce saying that India Farah had called her untalented and said she was undeserving of her spot in the final four. How do I feel about India Farah calling you untalented and undeserving of being in the final? She's talking all that to oh, yeah. dirty mouth She's and her hot Breath. And news of this spread around places like Twitter pretty quickly. Eve 6000 jumped in, allegedly writing, not asterisk saying Fierce is untalented and undeserving of top four, B, you were undeserving of being on Drag Race ever. And you're apparently undeserving of a toothbrush as well. And if y'all are totally out of the loop of why both of them are allegedly talking about this person's mouth, I've linked a video to that drama saga in the description of this video. And India Fira apparently got wind of this pretty quickly because she on her Instagram story posted a DM several that she had sent directly to Miss Fierce to clear the air. She wrote, what is this that you're saying? What have I said about you? And please show me the receipt before I take this publicly. Fierce replied, I was on a live and someone said that you said I'm quote, untalented and undeserving of being in the top four. India replied to that saying, I don't even know you, never heard of you, nor have I watched or know anyone on this season of CDR. That's BS and ridiculous that you believe someone said something that I supposedly said. Adding, wow, and all because someone commented on your live video, saying I said something. Wow. Wow, mom. I saw a cow, mom. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> And this all came to a pretty quick close after the two queens figured out what was going on. Miss Fierce tweeted this out. India messaged me privately and explained that she never made any comments about me. Please don't send her any hate. And good lord, messy fans stop being messy. It's not funny. That was kind of funny. It's not funny, stop it. And as a transition from international drag news and drama, <laughs> Did y'all see the tweet that Canada's Drag Race deleted this week? On the day the finale was airing, they tweeted this out. Happy hashtag Canada's Drag Race finale day. The crown is up for grabs, dot, dot, dot. Who is going to take it home? With a picture of the beautiful crown. And while this is not funny or dramatic in and of itself, the context is, may she rest in peace, the Queen of England has passed. And this was tweeted out that same day. Very unfortunate. <laughs> You can't write jokes this good. And there is, because of the Queen's passing, allegedly, some drama on the horizon. A Twitter account called TV UK Zone, which reports on the BBC's scheduling and such, tweeted out, hashtag Strictly Come Dancing, hashtag Drag Race UK, and Bake Off start dates expected to be postponed, TV Zone understands. Which again, we should take maybe with a grain of salt. This isn't coming directly from Drag Race or BBC, so stay tuned on that. And now let's get into the drag and drama of the cast announcement from Druck 4. First up, Danny Beard. With the queen so beardy, she named herself after it. Danny is, as she points out, the first bearded queen on Drag Race UK, though not of the Drag Race franchise. The very first trailblazer to be cast and compete in a season with a beard was Madame Madness on Drag Race Holland. Ironically, though, that Danny is introducing herself to the world as Danny Beard and has a beard on, but the makeup that she's wearing is not in any way accentuating or highlighting 
highlighting the beard. In fact, it's hiding it, which I guess I thought was a little bit of a missed opportunity for her, because if that's going to be your thing and it's not in how you meet the world, I don't know. It didn't really make sense. But maybe she was just trying to give his versatility off the bat. She tells us her drag is about mixing club kid aesthetic with old school drag, something that when I perused her Instagram, I found she does quite well. Big hair, big body, and crazy looks. Super excited for what she's going to be doing. Danny's 29 from Liverpool, and look she's wearing is representing the liver bird, the symbol of Liverpool. The theme, by the way, for the entire cast promo was for the queens to represent their hometown in some way, shape, or form. And how she's represented the liver bird in her drag here, I think is really interesting. I love the androgyny that she's presenting here, and she truly is giving us artsy, glam, campy, interesting. The colors are beautiful. And even the way she's layered the different kinds of feathers in the different blue tones to create all that beautiful texture, very, very visually stunning. And I love the hat. Danny, why so blue? This look is hot. Next up, I'm baby. Oh no, she's baby. Literally, that's her drag name just baby. She's 25 from South London. She describes herself as London's Afro-punk princess and spends a lot of time talking up her performance and dance skills, possibly dropping us some hints she could be the lip sync assassin of the season. When quick scroll through her Instagram and I'd believe it, every outfit she wears is danceable, performable, and girl, you know when you see that, it's over. Even the promo look that she's wearing, you know she could tear up a stage in that. I love that beautiful, very on-trend tie-dye of the blues and the whites and those deeper brown colors, and the strips of crystals curving and swerving all throughout her look. And did y'all notice the crystals literally hanging from her hair? Stunning. Baby even mentions they've studied musical theater, and I think she'll be a very important contrast to some of these look-focused queens that we'll get to in here just a second. But baby, 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 this look is hot. <laughs> Next up, we've got John Burr's Blonde, who's 33 and from Belfast. Or Belfast? Not Bell Slow. She says she's been doing drag for 14 years, longer than I've been alive, and puts herself into the fast fashion category of the drag world, continuing to describe herself as a high fashion pig. This queen is very campy, very goofy, also apparently not afraid to make fun of herself, says that if you see her in a show, you're going to be seeing lots of crab walking, which I guess means that she can't dance very well. Her look, she says, is inspired by the beautiful fields of Northern Ireland. This is her interpretation of what a farmer would be if they were a fashionable farmer. And I went back and forth on this. I do see the Irish references here and I understand the direction she was going, but this look of what we have from our cast today is not my favorite. And I like the details of the little feather in her cap, the three leaf clover on her knee. Gotta protect those knees. And there is overall something interesting about this look, but there's also something about it I feel like is unfinished. The jacket and pants, I think need some tighter tailoring to bring in her silhouette just a little bit. Because all these oversized pieces are kind of swallowing her whole and the makeup and hair isn't really helping her either. She is but just a simple farmer. However, this look is a May the luck of the Irish be with her though. Next up, Cheddar Gorgeous, who's 38 and from Manchester and describes herself as a living spectacle, a cultural icon with a drag name that references Cheddar Gorge. Learn something new every day. Cheddar Gorge, by the way, is a landmark. It's like a giant valley, essentially. Photos here for your appreciation. This is a queen I've been appreciating on Instagram for years. They have a really unique, dark, artistic, and intelligent approach to their drag. She checks that old soul spooky glamour kind of box that, for example, I would say Joe Black or even Charity Case kind of filled on their seasons. And I bring those two names up not to directly compare any of them, but rather to highlight that their drag is all very alternative to what we see from a lot of the UK queens. And we haven't seen the producers receive that alternative drag well on the UK series. So I'm a little nervous for Miss Cheddar Gorgeous. And her look in this promo shot, I absolutely adore. She's giving as Queen B, complete with some antenna atop her bald head. I think this look is very tasteful in the construction, the material selection, and even the placement of the crystals to create dimension in the bottom part of that dress skirt. In a way, it's sort of understated for how loud and impactful it actually is. I'd let this Queen B sting me. This look is <laughs> Next up, Just May from Essex. Don't kill me for that. But you heard me right. Her name is Just May. And she has a self-proclaimed obsession with Jerry Halliwell. She also says that she is the premier Jerry Halliwell impersonator. Or maybe this actually is just Jerry Halliwell. 
it's not. Her Meet the Queen's interview kind of left me wondering why she didn't just name herself just Jerry. Because I feel like I left it knowing more about Jerry Halliwell than I did just May. And her Instagram doesn't provide many more clues to who this queen truly is. Regardless, I am interested to see what her drag is, though beyond just making jokes about Jerry Halliwell. Because the actual look she's wearing doesn't do a whole lot to explain to the world who she is either. She's wearing the flag of Essex, which is just a red background with three swords on it. It's campy and funny in a very dry, satirical way, as is her personality. She has this kind of flat delivery that says everything I'm saying is a joke and nothing is serious. In this look as a look, I don't mind. I just think it's missing a bit of polish. For example, I'm not so sure the wig she's wearing is doing a whole lot to expand upon the flag that she has loosely recreated on her body. And some of the details like the actual swords just sewn onto her waist look a little arts and craftsy. So I'm gonna leave this look with just a wrap. Next up, she's ready for her close-up. It's Starlet, and she's another, air quotes, look queen, who I've been admiring on Instagram for a couple of years now. Seriously, the technical precision with which she does her makeup is insane. She describes herself as polished pinup, which is evident in the look she is wearing today, and tells us that she is from Johannesburg, South Africa. But nowadays she resides in Surrey, and this look she has on is simple, elegant, gorgeous. It's gold as an homage to her hometown, Johannesburg, which is known colloquially as the City of Gold. And I think she very much has captured a refined aesthetic here. I'm getting the Marilyn Monroe references, and as a nice surprise, I might add, seeing every detail of this look is thought out and perfected just like her makeup is. This look is absolutely 24 karat golden hat. <laughs> However, I will say, she was a little demure in her interview. And drag race is often about being the loudest or funniest one in the room. Girl, you gotta play to the cameras. And because of that, I am a little nervous for Miss Starlet. But I hope she finds her spotlight. Next up, Sminty Drop, who is 23 and from Lancashire. I hope I said that right. Y'all bully me every time I say that city name. And if I didn't, get over it. And Sminty probably tells us in her interview she is from from the house of Kendall, of gothy Kendall, the biggest loser of RuPaul's Drag Race UK, went home first three years ago. And this queen, I am absolutely stoked to see hit the runway. Their Instagram looks are incredible, jaw-dropping, gorgeous, very alien supermodel, as she herself describes her drag is. She's gotta be, what, 10 foot tall in drag? Her appearance is so striking. And she's not just tall with great looks, but if you check out the Instagram captions, you'll see that she actually has made quite a few of these looks that she models. So let's focus on her promo look today. This is scary, sexy, interesting, weird. And I love the different textures that she's contrasting here, that shiny PVC on her legs versus that almost bug abdomen like bodice that she's wearing. She's kind of giving me drag Beetleborg mixed with a vampire bat in some ways. And obviously the way that hair swoops with the red crystals matching the shoes. I mean, this look from head to toe is absolutely breathtaking. And of course, five flames worth of hot. Why don't you come around and abduct me sometime? Next up, Black Papa, who's 29 and from Birmingham, but originally from the Caribbean. And this bitch had me completely dead when I was watching the Meet the Queens because she explains that her drag name is Born From Loving Spices, Pepper, and Peppa the Pig, who if you don't know had a viral clip years ago, and she's talking to her friend Susie on the phone, asking her if she knows how to whistle, because Peppa Pig can't and wants to learn how. Susie then effortlessly whistles, there is some silence on the phone, and Peppa Pig hangs up. And to not only explain this clip on your Meet the Queens promo, but to have your drag name be named after the iconic Peppa Pig, I love her. I love her for this. This is a queen who just based off her interview being extremely relatable and down to earth and seeing her look being the insanely high fashion, incredible look that it is, Girl, I'm gonna place my bets on final three, final four right now. Her look has to be one of the most beautiful of any promo shot ever. It's inspired by the brown pelican, the national bird of St. Martin, the Caribbean island she's from. And it's just, I mean, come on, absolutely breathtaking with all of those layered jewels, feathers, textures, sparkles glittering, and oh my God, the attention to detail unmatched. This look is hot. And by the way, her Instagram is full of more fashion, beauty, and insane drag. I can't wait to see what she does on this season. And next up, we've got Pixie Polite, who's 29 from Brighton, and describes herself as the Belle of Brighton. And she reveals there's quite a bit of drag race nepotism happening this season, as she is the drag sister of Something Wong, Bag of Chips, and Tia Coffee, also revealing that she dated Tia Coffee. She says she can sing, dance, do comedy, yada, yada, yada. I'm getting very entertaining. You want 
her to host the party type of drag queen, and is yet another self-proclaimed camp queen. Girl, they're gonna need to bring some tents for this season. Her look is tapping into those retro futuristic Judy Jetson Hooker kind of vibes, but make it Fabergé egg. The partial hoop cage skirt I think is a fun detail and a great contrast to this relatively simple bodysuit that also has some pretty crazy shoulder pads on it. And while this isn't the craziest or most in your face look here, I think she did a great job of presenting something pretty simple and pixie polite. I'm gonna give this a three flame hot. And next up, the literal doll of the season. Look at this queen. This is Dakota Shipper, who is 22 and from Sussex. I cannot believe that she's real. And she's not just perfect in this promo photo, but in all of her other Instagram ones. She's got a very clear aesthetic and perspective that she approaches drag with. She describes herself as 90s does 60s, saying her icon is Sharon Tate. And girl, she took that and ran all the way to the bank with it and I love it. She is, I guess, what some of these queens might call a look queen. I don't see tons of stuff, for example, of her in the clubs or out and about like some of her peers tonight. She also is proudly the first trans contestant of the Drag Race UK franchise, and her look is gorgeous, gorgeous. I mean, this is a very interesting way, I think, to approach a classic silhouette. She's got soft pastel color blocking, chunky heels, and some feathery hems on her sleeves. This look is obviously hot, but the big question mark, I think, remains. How will she apply this cute little aesthetic to the cutthroat competition the drag race can be, which is to ask how much of her talent is beyond the valley of the doll. Next up. Do -do 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 Thank you, that was my impression of a trumpet. We've got Le Phil. She describes herself as a singing, dancing Chinese pop star, the androgynous Asian sensation, and highlights that she does music gigs entwined with stories and performance art where the sets are sculptures, the costumes are couture, and the show is a piece of live art. Girl, show me where I can buy a ticket. I'd like to see it. Le Phil is 36 from Yorkshire and inspired by the brass band of her hometown. Obviously, she's got trumpet horns on her shoulders and the dress itself is like a marching uniform of sorts combined with even the bottom part of her dress looking like the head of a horn. Would you call the top of the horn part the head? Music people, let me know. And this queen talks herself up pretty loudly. She is clearly there to make an impression. And I love, I love confidence. And with this interesting way she approaches her drag, great personality and maturity, interest in music, I'm sure she will do well in this competition. This look is major and <laughs> Next up, Copper Top who's got two Ps in her last name. And girl, I'd settle for just one at this point. Who is 38 and from Cheltenham? Miss Coppertop is yet another self-described campy queen. She says her drag is pantomime. It's camp. It's her being a ginger. And Miss Coppertop comes off very comfortable and in control when she's on camera, I think tapping into that theater background. Her drag character, though, she says, is fairly new to the world, being only several years old. And a lot of her drag scrolling through her Instagram appears to tap into that theater side. Very loud, large production vibes going on, which follows through to her promo look, which is an homage to the Neptune statue in Cheltenham. And this look has some pros and cons. I love the contrast of her copper top with that blue dress, but I don't think she needed the back of the wig to be coming down to the front. All those curls on top of her head are really pretty and I think speak for themselves. And the look overall is, I think, more interesting when viewed from the waist up or when she's sitting and her legs are sticking out from the slit. And it kind of breaks up that almost bedsheet-like swallowing that's happening with the drapey fabric. And Copper's look, comparatively speaking, I don't think is as refined as some of her competition, but I like that it displays exactly who she says she is, a campy theater queen. So I'd leave this look with a warming <sighs> those are our new girls. What do you think? I think they all did an incredible job. It was a great promo in Meet the Queens and the level of talent across this cast, I predict will be killer. And this season's going all out. The guest judges as reported by whattowatch.com will be Joanna Lumley, Allison Hammond, Hannah Waddingham, Boy George, Lorraine Pascal, Mel B, Wow. Ollie Alexander and my personal favorite on this list, FKA Twigs. And finally, as for my hottest hot of the promo shoot, I'm gonna give it to Black Peppa. I also asked my patrons over on patreon.com to vote for their hottest hot, and they've chosen Black Peppa as well. Don't forget, you can help support the Bussy Queen channel by joining my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where I release exclusive content like reaction videos and where you'll get access to things like the Bussy Queen Discord server. And new to the channel, 
channel, I've just activated YouTube memberships. So if you click the join button next to the subscribe button, you'll get exclusive channel perks like membership badges right next to your name, showing how long you've been a member of the channel, special emojis you can use in the comment section. And you can even get your name in the description of my videos by joining the bus driver tier. See you later. Love ya. Bye. Well, I got the results of my test back and I'm positive for everything. I agree. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing the premiere of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. And you know the season's gonna be good because RuPaul's already talking about coffee enemas. I'll take two. Today our newest batch of test subjects did a Spice Girls inspired photo shoot for the mini challenge. And in the main challenge, they served not one, but two looks. Keeping it 100, a BBC TV inspired look to celebrate the BBC's 100th anniversary. And who are Ooh. Signature drag with their charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent on full display. And we've also got some tea to sip, so we'll be breaking down each queen's looks and taking sips along the way as we progress through the video. Now grab a knife and have a slice. First up, it's Cheddar Gorgeous. Cheddar is a queen who, if you didn't notice while watching the episode, is highly respected in the UK drag community. Pretty much every queen had something to say about her, whether it was she was the first queen they ever saw or RuPaul herself saying that she was paying respects to her. But of course, with all of that comes great expectation. Mother did not disappoint, though. For the BBC runway, she came out as the BBC test card, which is basically, from what I understand, the screen that was broadcast as a placeholder when the BBC went off air. And what I mean by that, for my Gen Z audience watching, there once was a time, back in my day, that you couldn't just see everything everywhere all at once all of the time. You had to pick up the old TV magazine and tune in at the exact time you wanted to watch your show. And I really appreciated this look from Cheddar because it is immediately weird and different. She took the creepy clown from this title card, became it, and then made a dress out of all those lines, shapes, and colors that are seen throughout the rest of that title card. She's even got some X's and O's from the tic-tac-toe board coming across the top part of her gown. This look is beep hot. And for her second signature drag runway, she continues the theme of showing us exactly who she is, unashamed and unafraid. She describes this look as post-industrial alien non-binary warrior deity, and it's giving exactly that. It's breathtaking, and I particularly love the way she crafted the headpiece and how it captures the light and all of the different angles. It's so beautiful. Why don't you come around and abduct me sometime? This look is hot. Next up, blonde. Genres blonde. Okay, side note, how great would the drag name James Blonde be? Oh. I'm telling Sailor. Can I can we text? I am Let me just let me out. let me just ah. tell you something. It's gonna make your night better. What? what? Think about the drag name James Blonde. Okay. Isn't that great? I feel like I've heard it. I just told it to you. Oh, I, it just sounds maybe uh, okay. Okay. Okay, wow. <laughs> Anyways, Ms. Jobbers was a queen who really proved to be a wild card tonight, and I like that. Her entrance look was giving me a little bit of Lady Gaga and American Horror Story Hotel vibes. And her runways were funky, fresh, and fun. On the BBC TV one, she did Blue Peter. Blue Peter. Been a while since I've had a Blue Peter. Wow. Oh. Which is, my sources are saying, a British children's television entertainment program. And not only that, it's the longest running children's TV program in the world, having been broadcast since October 1958. But back to John Burr's, her homage to Blue Peter took the blue ship logo and turned it into not only a custom purse, but used it as the basis of inspiration for this kind of Barbarella meets 60s meets little dolly dress. I think it's really cute. I love the applique on the bottom of that skirt him. The only thing I changed about it, I think, were those stark white stockings, which I get were part of the era of fashion that she's going for, but they just felt a tad plain in the bottom part of the look, but I do still think this look is hot. And for runway number two, what was that? I love the story behind this and how it represents not only who she is as a queen through fashion and style, but also who she is as a person behind all the drag and makeup of it all. This is her dad's old motocross gear, which she's deconstructed and reconstructed into something beautiful and interesting to look at. Girl, I caught the heat coming off this exhaust pipe and it was hot. Next up, eh, what's up doc? <laughs> It's LaFille. She had the charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent to walk in with not one, not two, but three 
carrots on this look. Needless to say, can't wait to get filled up this season. For her BBC runway, she did Pudsy Bear, who's a fictional mascot character for the BBC's charity Children in Need. And our mission is to help ensure every child in the UK is safe, happy, secure, and has the opportunities they need to reach their potential. And I love everything about LaFille doing this reference and the charity itself. However, the look for the RuPaul's Drag Race runway, I don't think reached its full potential. Her interpretation of Pudsy Bear is quite literal, and there are some elements of it that feel a tad too crafty. For example, the Easter basket she's carrying around that appears to just have some polka dots glued to the side. I also think using that single yellow color to construct the dress part of this gown was a bit of a missed opportunity because you kind of lose the shape and fashion of it in those runway lights. The look is adorable, but costumey and doesn't really tell me anything about LaFille's approach to drag, so I'm going to leave this look with a and for all you, we do learn a little bit more about LaFille. She comes out in a flowy red gown with sleeves and trains and drapery with all kinds of crazy shapes and movement that you can see as she dances down the runway. And I will say, thank God she was dancing down the runway because this definitely was a dress that needed the performance aspect of it so that she didn't just look swallowed in fabric. And she tells us that red is a really important to her because in the Chinese culture, it represents joy and warmth. And for what this look is, represents, I think it does a much better job of filling us up on LaFille. However, it felt a tad frantic on the runway, and I think small design element changes could have really enhanced this look. Like for example, doing some cutouts where there's red mesh fabric on the bodice area to give a little more contrast to the look. All things considered though, I think this was an effective look, so I'm gonna give it a safe three flame hot. Next up, Sminty Drop. Sminty Drop. And girl, she is here in episode one to stake her claim on the title of Look Queen. My God. Absolutely loved what she did in her entrance. This look is striking. I love the play of the soft white and pastel blues, contrasting the severity and drama of the horns all over this look. And on the runway, oh my God. Her BBC TV runway is giving homage to Antiques Roadshow, which I thought was a brilliant conceptual choice, because after all, this is an international audience with an international judging panel. And the judges like Rue and Michelle and audience members, such as my myself across the pond immediately know what she's doing. For those of you that may not know though, it's a show where everyday people can bring in antiques from their attics and have them evaluated for their true worth. Like this woman getting her Tang Dynasty marble lion statue evaluated for $120,000 to $180,000. My personal favorite item I ever brought in though is the Oi Mister, You Me Dad doll. JK Kamara, it's just a meme. Anywho, Sminty is giving us lamp and I love Antique lamp. Y'all, seriously, this is one of the finest pieces of fashion and drag artistry to ever hit the RuPaul's Drag Race runway. And I'm not joking, bitch. What would be the base of the lamp is deconstructed into armor pieces, creating a bodice, side guards, and of course she's got the beautiful pastel blue lampshade atop her head, which is preventing her from even getting through the runway door frame. What I love most though is this look is distinctively sminty, and we don't even know that much about her yet. And in a way, this look is kind of hauntingly beautiful. In fact, I'm quite tempted to give this lamp a rub to see if a genie comes out. This look is hot. And for her second look, she proves she is the queen of limbo. I can only hope that just for the dragon drama of it all, that she struggles to walk through those runway arches every single episode. Beauty is pain after all. And this look is just as beautiful and strikingly distinctively unique as the first. The headgear, the dedication to the look. Your honor, I testify with my right hand up to God she is serving. This look is a little French Renaissance, a little Tudor, and 100% sucks. To our Queen of Limbo, I give this look a hot. <laughs> Next up, it's Baby. And her BBC TV runway is paying homage to Rasta Mouse, who, oh my God, has gotta be one of the cutest little characters I've ever seen. And Rasta Mouse, I've learned, was a stop motion animated children's show on BBC from the years of 2012 to 2015. And this look I'll say is relatively simple, but so is the reference. And I love that the more you look at this look, the more detailed it actually gets. She's turned that plain white t-shirt that Rasta Mouse was wearing into a fishnet dress dress with a little bikini underneath. And I love the use of that fabric pattern on the Marshall hat. Her hair is gorgeous with those gold jewels in it and a beautiful silky cape or duvet, perhaps, that she's carrying down the runway with her. I think she 100% here hit the reference and told us exactly who she is as a queen. This look is hot. And for her, you. 
look. She says she wanted to look like her nan's sofa. I love the different textures and shapes that she used. And this look, I want to contrast a little bit with Late Phil's because they both are solid red looks. However, I think Baby's was a lot more successful because she was able to play with some cutout pieces like in the back. And I love the way that puffer coat material was a shinier texture, really allowing the runway lights to play and reflect and really show off the silhouette of her body. Puff, puff, pass out. This look is hot. Next up, our very own Scandinavian model, Dakota Schiffer. Hardly know her. Really, we hardly know her. It's the first episode. And Miss Dakota, as she says, is proudly representing the trans community for the first time on the UK franchise. She also says, though, she has a lot of unique perspective to offer. And I agree. I think her take on fashion is from a very unique perspective that I quite enjoy. However, the execution in this episode was not as good as her Instagram photos are. But let's take a look. For the BBC TV runway, she did Anne Boleyn in Horrible Histories, which by the way is a sketch comedy show that was broadcast on the BBC TV from 2009 to 2014, parodying, well, Horrible Histories. Like for example, the execution of Anne Boleyn on display here for her runway. And this look, like Dakota, is very cute. However, it doesn't have a lot of depth. There's just not many layers to this look besides, yes, it's giving Anne Boleyn in, but make her sexy and yes she looks good however where is the part of this outfit that distinctively says dakota schiffer and could not be worn by anyone looking to simply dress like anne boleyn it's just a little too safe and a tad costumey in that sense so i'm gonna give this look a and sadly, Dakota makes the same mistake twice in this challenge. Her second runway for Rue Are You just doesn't have a lot of layers. You know, like an onion would. Where are my ogres at? Let me hear your onions clack. <laughs> This look, again, like her first, is giving a tad costumey. Anyone could wear this cute little 80s prom dress, and anyone and many have worn this Anastasia type of winter hat. She's got an 80s prom to attend at 5 p.m., but has to walk 10 miles in the snow, uphill both ways. And I hope for her sake she makes it to prom, but this look is a rot. I do want to comment though, I really enjoyed her on my TV. I think she's got a great little personality. However, has she had enough time in the oven as a queen to really develop and own that unique perspective. Guess we'll see. And next up, Danny Beard. Danny Beard. Danny Beard. <laughs> Who, as we find out, a little behind the scenes tea and drama, came in first in a drag competition versus Pixie Polite, who came in second. Fun fact, she apparently also has competed in Britain's Got Talent back in 2016. For her BBC TV runway, she is doing Mr. Blobby, who, oh my God, is nightmare fuel. And while the UK loves Mr. Blobby, apparently the US opinion piece writers over at the New York Times in 1994 were writing this about Mr. Blobby. Some commentators have called him a metaphor for a nation gone soft in the head. Others have seen him as proof of Britain's deep-seated attraction to trash. <laughs> Iconic. Anyways, Danny Beard's interpretation of Mr. Blobby is spot on. It's giving 60s Valley of the Dolls meets Lee Bowery Club Kid in the 90s. It's super fun and 100% has that gender bendy aspect that Danny Beard brings to pretty much every look that she serves. I absolutely adore the delicate femininity contrasting with the harsh masculinity of this look. Danny Beard, this look is hot. And her second runway is also interesting, but I don't think quite as exciting. It's a little Grace Jones inspired per perhaps with the headgear. I love those metal tones contrasting with the dark PVC shiny pieces of the bodice. Most importantly though, I think in this runway and her first, Danny very clearly staked out who she is and what her perspective is on drag in this competition. And that is so important to do early on and stand out from the rest. This look is hot. However, I will say two looks where you just painted the beard white and in the promo look, I kind of want to see her use the beard in the look a little bit other than just painting it white. Hmm, but that's just me. And next up is just May. Drag Race UK's favorite number one Jerry Halliwell impersonator able to perform her solo back catalog from 1997 to 2003. Kind of. <laughs> This is a queen who out the door felt like she was being thrown so many bones, but failed to catch them. I mean, the mini challenge was literally inspired by the Spice Girls and for someone who loves Jerry Halliwell so much so as to make her entire drag persona about impersonating Jerry Halliwell. I don't know, thought maybe she could have won that. Anyways, let's move in her runways. For BBC TV, she is giving us the bust of Queen Victoria from EastEnders. You ain't my mother! Yes, I am! 
am. I love culture. So this look, did anyone else immediately think of Bag of Chips Oscars look? Ah! It really was not living, laughing, or loving for me. And I, the thing is, this could have been really cool. However, she left a little too much to the imagination, or I guess nothing at all, with the bottom part of her look, which was literally just a brown piece of fabric wrapped around her waist. And yes, the character she was doing was literally a bronze bust statue. However, as we've been talking about in these runways, the drag caliber is so damn high on this season that you can't just do a literal interpretation of a look. You've got to take it into your own lane, flip it, twist it, eat it, throw it up, eat it again, and spit it out on the runway for RuPaul and the rest of the fans to enjoy. This look was lacking more than just construction. It was a rat. And for her, who are you, runway? This was another look that really was not that bad. It accomplished, I think, what she set out to do. I just don't think that she set out to do a lot with the look. It's a cute gown giving Union Jack flag meets just May with her face printed all over the fabric. The other thing I kind of noticed with May is I feel that she's very stuck in the joke of herself being the joke. And I want another layer beyond just May. I want the April showers that lead to May. I want the hot summers, the cold winters, and the... Spring. <sighs> yeah, I'm losing my I'm losing my mind. This look was just a little rue of the mill. It's a rat. Next up, copper top with two B's. And I'll say it now, for someone that calls themselves a top, sure did a lot of bottoming this episode. And first of all, can we please talk about how in the workroom they were bringing up that she's 38 and discussing that age as if it were super old? Girl, that's not old at all. She's young and hung and marches to the sound of her own drum. Here we are for a BBC TV runway. She's doing Julie Walters in the Victoria Woods Two Soup sketch, which all you really need to know the context for is that Julie Walters is carrying out the two soups to some customers at a restaurant and is spilling them along the way. Two soups! And Copper Top, I think, did a really great job of giving that old-fashioned, over-the-top, whimsical, campy humor in this runway presentation. All of the elements of the outfit, like the soup bowls on her tatas, are very large and orange, I might add. The collar pieces are big and the silhouette is larger than life. Everything she's doing is extremely characterized, which is why I was absolutely shocked to hear Michelle Visage talking about how she was looking for ups and downs in the runway presentation. I was like, girl, what? She literally nailed it. And at least she was doing something on the runway that was actually entertaining while there were some queens who can't even walk in heels yet. Not that we need to name names and compare here, but let's call it like it is. Anyways, I'll give this two soups look to Pots. Her second runway though for Rue Are You, eh, not quite as entertaining for me. And I actually can't show you what's written on her dress in completion because of YouTube monetization policy. Thanks, Susan. But I'm sure you can guess based on what I am showing you and her reason for putting ginger and that word on her dress were to explain that she is reclaiming these slurs, if you will, that she's been called throughout her life, which I think is a great, powerful message. This runway presentation is also extremely copper, very orange, and over the top of... <laughs> the color ginger that she both calls herself and is reclaiming here. However, this look kind of reminds me of that one runway, I forget the name of the designer that did it, but they had giant words printed across the backs of dresses, and I personally hate, hate, hate when somebody just puts words on a look. Like, what is that? I think runway and fashion are kind of like pictures. They should say a thousand words, and if they don't on their own, maybe go back to the drawing board. I don't write sexy, talented, and successful across my chest everywhere I go. And in that same vein, I don't want to read your runway, but I sure will. <laughs> I'm literally the funniest person I know. Oh my god. So, I'm gonna give this look a rat. Next up, it's style, and she's very quiet. She's very pretty, but she's very, very quiet. In fact, I'd venture to guess she'd have quite the successful as Mertist YouTube career if she wants it. If you're watching, girl, just a thought. They get millions of views. Anywho, in this episode, we learn Starlet has only performed once in her entire drag career, which honestly kind of shows when she hits the runway, talks to the judges, and even does her confessionals. She feels, as Rue says, timid and unsure of who she is and how she presents. And all of that can be easily learned, it just takes time to open up the shell and taste the meat inside. 
Her first runway honoring the BBC TV is Patsy Stone from Absolutely Fabulous, played by Dame Joanna Lumley, who is sat right in front of us on the judging panel. And for as shy as our little starlet is, I think she did a pretty good job of playing up the camp factor of this runway. And I like how the look is giving Chanel tweed fashion meets trashy, gross, and dirty with the panties hanging between the legs, the rhinestoned bottle of age-appropriate liquids, and smoking sticks betwixt her fingers. This look is trashy and absolutely fabulously hot. More importantly though, Joanna herself loved the look, even if she did have to point out that she had the quote only about 90% right, missing the word little on the back of the jacket. Which, yes, I will fairly critique, we did not need the quote on the back of the jacket. Moving on. It is in her second runway where she's playing herself that I think she actually struggled a little bit more. Because for as beautiful as she looks in this Cinderella-esque look, I mean, she looks like a damn near perfect little doll, it was her charisma and nerve that didn't quite shine through. That shyness and timidness overpowered her here, much like it did in her entrance. And like I said earlier, she's gonna really need to open up if she wants to survive in this competition. Pretty only goes so far on the RuPaul's Drag Race track. But yes, this look is hot. Next up, Pixie Polite. Over on the runway for her BBC TV look, move over OnlyFans, she is giving Only Fools. The context here is she's doing a character called Del Boy from the TV show Only Fools, and according to Wikipedia, Del Boy is often regarded as one of the greatest comedy characters in the history of British television, and for as much as I didn't get this look when I originally saw it, I thought it was interesting enough. And I liked the reveal from that more masculine trench coat to these very cutely styled pants and top with little rhinestones giving some sparkle and shine, and I was intrigued by the dragon drama of her opening that suitcase to a blow-up doll. I would give this look a hot. <laughs> but for who are you? I wasn't loving this look. I really think it struggled a little bit. Is she a volcano? Is she a cauldron with fire coming out of the top? I don't know what's going on with all the colors. And then finally, when she pulls the rainbow up behind her, I realized that she is the clouds, the sun, and the rainbow. Eh, maybe if it were a double rainbow, I would have liked it a little bit more. This of these looks tonight on the runway felt very, very crafty. But I think worst of all, this look told us absolutely nothing about Pixie Polite. I, is she a meteorologist? Does she just like rainbows? Is she a kindergarten teacher? I don't know. But I will say, at least in both of her runways tonight, she had a good, solid presentation of self and character, which among some of these newcomers to drag, I think will take her quite far in the competition, even if we don't know who she is yet. Honey, she's got a big storm coming. This look is a rat. And next up. <sighs> Girl, grab the dinner plate and throw out the salt because black pepper is here. I love this queen. I cannot believe we are only one episode in and already have our winner. She is such a unique face and beauty. She has all of that wrapped up and combined together with an extremely charismatic personality that is both funny and smart. Her references are so great, niche, and broad at the same time. I admit, I stand Black Peppa. How could you not? Anyways, let's start with the entrance look. She walks in and at first I'm thinking, okay, little club kid couture, kind of plain. And then she takes off her face. <laughs> In my reaction video for this premiere, I had to rewatch that entrance several different times. I was so gooped and gagged. And by the way, you can watch that reaction video and relive some of the best moments of the episode with me by joining my Patreon. That's my members only website where my patient family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to exclusive videos like those reactions and other unique benefits like having your Patreon icon appear in my videos when you vote on hottest hot polls like these patrons. And you can join by clicking the link in the description of this video to visit patreon.com slash bussyqueen. See you there. But yeah, for an old cynic like me who's seen 5,000 seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race, this was a truly special moment to enjoy. For her first runway, BBC TV, she is giving us the sequel to Mr. Blobby. And that is a pun I think worth expanding upon because where Danny Beard gave us the more gender bendy, masculine Mr. Blobby, I think Black Peppa went in that more feminine direction. I love the giant ruffle pieces that she's used to create that open open skirt. It's very Rukoko Victorian fashion mixed with modern elements that makes for such an elegant, weird, strange, and beautiful look. I also love the fingers that she incorporated onto this because they reminded me of the hot dog fingers from the movie Everything Everywhere All at Once. The girls that get it, get it. And no, nothing matters, but this look is hot. And for her Ru Are You look, she is giving chocolate. 
chocolate. Melanin chocolate, that is. And she says this look is really special to her because she gets to finally celebrate who she is and be proud of that dark skin tone she said she was made fun of for when she was younger. And she not only is able to celebrate herself here, but has such a unique and beautiful fashionable moment on the runway. She looks elegant, divine, and like an ethereal chocolate goddess going down the runway until <gasps> she loses her headpiece. How's your head? Which turns out not to matter so much. She kind of plays it off as not a big deal and the judges praise her for it. I think though, the little headpiece falling off moment might have been planned for a little drama and intrigue because let's not forget, this is an extremely creative, intelligent, and funny queen who I think is thinking about how to give some interesting TV moments. That's just a theory though. A drag theory. Anywho, Cadbury's never looked better. This look is hot. See, I know British things. And I've got to say, oh my God, what a beautiful display of drag, talent, and fashion on this runway tonight. The girls really, really turned it out. I think this was easily the best and most fashionable premiere episode we've seen across the Drag Race UK franchise ever. I loved it. And the win, rightly so, I think, goes to Black Peppa this episode, which means, yes, she won the mini challenge and the maxi on the premiere. Guess two faces are better than one. And in the bottom three this episode, we have Copper Top, Dakota Schiffer, and Just May. Dakota and Just May end up lip syncing, which I agree were definitely of the bottom of the bottoms tonight, but I did not understand the placement of Copper Top there with them. And lip sync, which I did react to over on my Patreon, results in Dakota Schiffer staying. And this decision I do very much agree with. I think Just May appeared to give up or just not really show that she truly wanted to be there. And while Dakota, sure, could have had some better dance skills, I think she really succeeded in showing the judges that she was not ready to go home. But I'd love to know what y'all think, so don't forget to let me know down in the comments below. Who do you think should have won? Who should have been in the bottom two? And who should have gone home? And finally, for my hottest hats this episode, in the BBC TV runway category, I'm going to give it to Sminty Drop. And for who are you? Black Peppa. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots, and it seems we're in agreement today. They also voted for Sminty and Black Peppa. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye. The only thing standing in your way is you. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Hot. And today we'll be reviewing episode two of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. And good God, this season is Ding Dong, Bing Bang, Bong, which is just British for Anywho, today our queens were challenged to write, record, and perform verses to come alive. Drag Race UK's newest viral hit debuted at the Yastonbury Rock Festival. I'm like so into rock music right now. And the runway category was Neon Nights. So we'll be breaking all that down queen by queen and then at the end of today's video going over Pixie Polite's tweets where she clears the air on what actually happened to her entrance look and she and Lawrence addressed some of the Drag Race fans' fat phobia on Twitter. Now, let's rock out with our frocks out. Ah! Period ah, period ah. Uh. <laughs> First up, and in the order they perform, we've got Baby from Team Triple Threats. So while she and the rest of her team are sitting around the workroom table writing their lyrics, she casually reveals to everyone that, fun fact, she's got a degree in songwriting. Is that a degree in songwriting in your back pocket, or are you just happy to see me? But when she revealed this, I did, conspiracy theory, have a little feeling that Black Peppa may have known this because Baby was her first choice in this challenge as team captain. Regardless of whether or not Peppa had that prior knowledge, though, maybe prove the best choice of the night. She sang, Sizzling and sweet, I'm oh so delicious. Dress like a queen, but I'll give you the business. Step on the scene and I'm taking your interest. Look like a dream, but nobody need pinches. There was just a lot of great imagery in what she was singing with sweet and delicious queen business, then tying that in with interest like the stock market. I'm interested. And the wordplay she did of flipping the phrase, pinch me, I'm dreaming into that last line was really, really fun. This performance was hot, hot, hot across the board. And on the runway, she is giving us all the colors of the neon rainbow. Pink, yellow, orange, green. And my, 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 feathers, chains, and whips excite me. I think she perfectly hit both parts of the brief with this. This is absolutely a night raver girl type of look and certainly is neon in color. The judges though, in particular Graham Norton, were talking about how the 
this look might just be a little too much and I did not agree with that at all. I thought it was just enough. The one thing I would do is maybe swap out the yellow wig for a pink just to give a little more contrast to the outfit because I do kind of lose the back part of those yellow feathers around the collar with the yellow wig. It just all blends together. In the look you may recognize the style of a little bit. It's by Bang London, a designer who did lots of Tase's looks and I love their work for all of the movement that they incorporate in their runways. I think their outfits are absolutely amazing. Go check them out. But this is a phenomenally hot look that absolutely matches Baby's high energy style. And next up tonight, we've got Starlet, who as we found out this episode is about 50 shades of uncomfortable with pretty much everything. And I started to realize as I watched Starlet on my screen, I am interpreting that she is mortally terrified of not being perfect. And girl, I feel you, the desire to be perfect. Sometimes it almost kills me. But in my experience, embracing imperfection has taken me a lot further than trying to be perfect all the time. But let's break down this timid little Starlet's performance. She sang, burlesque perfection, vintage collection, face like Minogue, waist like Monroe. Great lyrics, by the way, but this next little couplet absolutely killed me. Straight out of a movie. I'm a little bit goofy. <laughs> That took me out. It was giving me very, I'm not like the other girls, I'm a little bit goofy vibes. Michelle said it best. Starlet, tell that to your face. Because yes, I actually loved her lyrics, but the actual performance was like watching a reanimated corpse. And all this was just killing me to watch because I really do love this queen. I mean, the level of sophistication and elegance and class in her drag, the way she looks, walking Instagram photo. But girl, when the photo turns into a video, we gotta make it a little more exciting. So yeah, the lyrics were absolutely hot, but the performance was a ratted corpse. And the irony of all of this is she had absolutely no idea Idea that she looked dead on stage. In the little untucked moment with her group, everyone is talking about moments where they messed up and she looks them all dead in the eyes and goes, I hate to be that girl, but I felt really confident on that stage. <laughs> Delusion, convince yourself. But Irma Gerd, for as dull as she was in the performance, she was beautiful on the runway. This look, it is immaculate. It's neon in that beautiful pink crushed velvet accent with all those lovely yellow feathers. It's giving me She Devil by Neon Knight mixed with the Pink Panther. The silhouette that she has created here is absolutely beautiful and I love how your eye can follow the tip of that triangle tail up to those beautiful horns on the headpiece down to the pointy stiletto boots. Plus the makeup. Good God, the makeup on this queen. <sighs> the devil went down to Georgia, but apparently retired over in the UK. This look is hot. <laughs> Normal girls would never do this, but I'm a little bit goofy. <laughs> Next up, Sminty Drop. Let's take a look at what she sang. I'm not just a mannequin, I got the dolls panic and long lace, tongue tight. Tell me, can you handle it? Blow you away with a glossy kiss. Modern renaissance with a bad girl twist. They packed big, but I'm back and bigger. Your fees all low, you can watch my figure. Oh my gosh, like who is she? It's my N-T-Y-D-R-O-P. <sighs> Girl, <laughs> she got the entire dictionary in her lyrics, which was ultimately her downfall here because as fun as her lyrics were, she couldn't keep up with her own verse while on stage. She approached this rock song like a typical RuPaul's Drag Race bitch track, but the catch of this being a slow song, which featured each girl a little bit longer than normal, was that if they packed their verses too tight, like Sminty did, then they really just made their jobs that much harder. Sminty bit off more than she could chew and dropped it like it was rat. And over on the runway, she's not going to wear an old maiden's dress, but she will wear a troll doll meets Bride of Frankenstein fantasy with pasties. The overall visual effect, I will say, is stunning, striking even to look at. The wiggistry of this sculpted giant beehive thing on her head, I absolutely adore. It makes me think of Aquaria's very first drag on a dime runway she did. It basically is that look, just minus the umbrella. And I'm just pointing that out to say, I do feel like we have seen this type of look several many different times throughout the years on Drag Race, and it's not particularly fresh, except maybe in the colors that she chose, which were just the brief of the runway. So I'm gonna leave this with a two and a half flame warming up. Next up, blonde, John Burr's blonde. And Miss John Bell tonight picked the team name, Triple Threat. Why she picked that name, we may never know. And yes, I'm already getting lost in her lyrics one line in because she wrote so many words like Sminty did and then had trouble even herself fitting them into the song. Shamrock, rock and roll, the blonde pot of gold, a piece of heaven now that you're told, swerving left now, wasn't always right. What does that mean? Had to trust myself when I saw the light and then she absolutely destroys her verse and not in a good way. Just like potatoes, I'll give variety. <laughs> 
No ma'am, why are we singing about potatoes in a rock and roll song? A generic potato at that. Like, give me a sexy potato. Maybe loaded. Ooh, a loaded potato. Why don't you come around and load up my potato sometime? But yeah, her performance and lyrics were confusing across the board, and I think she even confused herself on stage a couple of different times. This potato had been left out on the counter for weeks, months, maybe even years, was growing sprouts, and then melted into a puddle of oozing rat. And Jonfer's Runway, funnily enough, is kind of giving baked potato wraps in tin foil, getting ready to go into the oven. Her look confused me as much as her performance did tonight. Because she comes out with this sign that says drag is art, and I expected for her to tear it apart. Hi, Sasha Valore. And yes, I am a little bit colorblind, but I will say the purple runway lights on this all orange neon piece made it look a little less neon than it actually was. And had she actually let this look really breathe and have its own orange zest moment on stage without the schmock thing, as the judges pointed out, I think it would have been sold a lot better. I will say though, she might have left the coat on because it appeared to me there were some fit issues in the top part of the look. It just seemed a tad baggy, so maybe she was trying to hide that. Overall though, as presented on the runway, it was just a little lost in translation. I'm gonna give this a and finally on Team Triple Threat, throw out the salt. We don't need it. We've got Black Pepper. And she sang, I'm the NB, Bendy, Caribbean flavor. I'll knock you out. High kick, Mayweather. Do y'all like my legs? <laughs> Me. Oh my God. When the coffee enema hits. Anyway, the first part of Black Pepper's verse was fun, punchy, and had a lot of personality and flavor. The second part of it though, I think she just started saying random words from what I understood in the lyrics that were published on WoW Presents. I have backbend, I'm dropping it. You better watch this silhouette. What you garn, wind it. Hot jelly sauce up in the club. <laughs> Dutty wine it, find it, na mind it. <laughs> Entertaining, yes, but all over the place, just like her performance was, and Michelle pointed this out as well. She was twisting, flipping, turning, backbending, death dropping, splitting. She just needed a little more fine tuning and balancing of all the flavors she included in her performance. But I do absolutely want to give her a safe <sighs> for what she delivered here. And Black Peppa on the runway, oh my god. Literally a ray of sunshine on this run. She looks so gorgeous. She's wearing a molded neon yellow silicone dress complete with the giant yellow feather hat. I also love the little nod to Diana Ross playing into the judges' favor. We know RuPaul loves her some Diana Ross. On Instagram, she said her neon runway was inspired by 90s Terry Mugler supermodels but covered in slime. The slime idea was inspired by watching Slime Time on Nickelodeon channel as a child. I love her references. Black is truly the supermodel of the spice cabinet and she is absolutely looking hot. And now, having looked at each queen from Team Triple Threat, I know I did rot a lot of their performances, but I want to reiterate, I think a lot of their actual songwriting was good. It was just as they talked about when they were in critiquing, way too ambitious. And if the weaker members of the group, and I mean weaker in performance, self-admittedly, Starlip and Sminty, had maybe spoken up a little more about wanting to take things slower, they could have been a lot more cohesive as a group. Because there is a lot of talent in this triple threat group. But there's also a lot of ego. They got a big ego. But a big ego isn't necessarily a bad thing. Seriously, if there's any boys out there with a big ego looking for a good time, oh, give me a call. Because I won't stop till you come <laughs> alive. <laughs> Okay. Next up, team number two, the queens of the bone age. Rock and roll, man. And first up, we've got Dakota Schiffer. Hardly know her. And Miss Dakota was an absolute delight on our screens this evening. I love that in-depth storytelling moment they did in the workroom with Dakota talking about her journey as a trans woman, coming out three different times, and how she went through that journey herself with her identical twin and with her parents. And Dakota, as team captain, I think was really great at recognizing her own weaknesses, and as a good leader should be, she was also very aware of her team members' weaknesses. Like when Danny Beard is having trouble with some of the choreo, she checks in. Hey Danny, are you doing okay? And in the challenge, she is just a good team member as she is a leader. She sang, trans activist with the mostest, politically engaged on the best dressed list. Shippers coming to you, baby. Oh my God, she should get a brand deal with Swiffer. She could Swiff up the competition. Her lyrics, I'll say, weren't the punchiest of what we've heard tonight, but I think she did a great job of staying in the rock and roll vein of storytelling and I liked when she got a little nasty on the track at the end with that baby. I'm gonna definitely give her a hot. On the runway though, I actually love the dress she's wearing, but you can't even see it. I wish she had done this look without the puffer coat, get rid of those headphones. They're just a little obviously 
headphones. And I didn't understand why the Pikachu ears were on there at all. And then I would love to have seen her add some black into this look, like on the wig and maybe some black color blocking squares on the dress. Doing so would have been very in line with her 60s mod fashion inspiration. And I think added a bit more chicness to this look, which ultimately is giving Apre Ski more than I think neon lights. So I'm gonna give this look a peek a peek a rat. Next up, let's get the filled together. A girl, was she dancing? She did enough dancing for all of her team members combined. This girl has more energy than RuPaul after three coffee enemas. She sang, oh, I whip my hair to smash gender roles. Don't try to box me in, I'll smash the glass ceiling. And it could just be me, but I loved these lyrics. I think she did such a good job really truly giving rock and roll. Plus you could tell she was having the time of her life on stage. She truly was a professional rock and roller. And I'm gonna give her five flames for the lyrics and five for the performance for 10 out of 10 <laughs> flames here. But over on the runway, this look was really interesting because I learned a lot from it. This look is intended to be a nod to when Naomi Campbell was sentenced to pick up trash as a part of community service for being found guilty in a court case where she threw her Blackberry at her maid. And in this five days of community service she was sentenced to, she notably wore high fashion Vogue style runways to do that in. But I think this look may be missed the mark a little bit because it's not giving neon nights and I couldn't actually find any reference photos of Naomi Campbell wearing a highlighter orange vest like you might see on somebody who is doing said community service. So in addition to being a reference that needed, I think, too much explanation, she didn't necessarily hit the brief. And worst of all, we actually didn't even get to see the dress in the runway that they showed on the episode. You can only really see it in the photo they posted over on Instagram. Was that really her fault though? I don't know. But because this overall runway presentation missed the mark in several different ways. For me, I have to give it a rat. Next up, don't turn up the heat or she'll start melting. She's melting. It's Cheddar Gorgeous. Let's talk about her lyrics first. Deity, alien queen, punk rock witch with a twisted dream. Queer your mind, embrace the hazy. I'll get those fluids going crazy. Great lyrics. Perfect for the vein of rock and roll. But the performance part of her performance, girl, she was looking more like a triple threat than a queen of the bone age. You go back and look, almost any time that she is in a shot, she is offbeat, behind on the steps, looking over at the team and seeing what they're doing, trying to catch up. She really, really just missed the mark on the choreography. Gotta give her a rat. But oh my god, on the runway, I'm seeing double, triple, quadruple, quintuple. Wait, sorry, I think it must be the mushrooms. This is one of the best looks of the night. She truly is giving us Deity, alien queen here. Mushroom alien queen from Mars. Also, trend alert with all of the mushrooms that we've been seeing on RuPaul's Drag Race lately. Willow Pill, Evie Yodley, now Cheddar Gorgeous. <gasps> the holy trinity of mushrooms. Anyways, I don't need to keep tripping over how good this look is. Just open your eyes. It's not just the psychosyllabin. This look is hot. Next up, copper top with two peas. Who sang? Ooh, let's rock, let's rock. Rock it in a frock. <laughs> Let me hear you scream. I am a queen. I liked her verse, but it felt like you would hear her and see her do this verse on a kid's show. It was frantic, crazy, high energy, which for this challenge worked very well. This queen is so campy and silly and crazy and I really do actually enjoy her. I hope y'all are not misunderstanding me here. I just can't help but laugh because she's so goofy. Ugh. Starlet watching Copper Top. Write that down. Write that down. But yeah, I would definitely give this queen's performance five hot flames and her actual lyrics maybe like three. They weren't that deep, but she rocked the hell out of simple. And this performance was overall very hot. <laughs> copper top, copper top, copper top, copper top. Let's rock it in a frog. And on the runway, copper top is on the runway and she's dressed like Miss Cracker. Hey. <laughs> This look, I like the jacket and the puff sleeves, but what's killing me on this look are the, I guess you would call them culottes? There's just something about, I think, that poopy brown color of fabric that she has used to construct the baggy part of these shorts that I just am not vibing with. I also do not understand it all how this is supposed to be neon nights where i think the vibe was supposed to be party raver girl more so than whatever kind of tudor french george washington fantasy this is this look is a Next up, Danny Bear. She came up with the team name tonight, which I think was part of the reason this team won tonight. It is such a phenomenal team name. Queens of the Bone Age. And she sang, I'm a she with a beer. You think it's the oddest. I'm not being funny. Why would I be modest? I'm a mother tucking goddess, baby. 
And her lyrics, I feel similarly as to these as I do about coppers. Not that deep or super personal. However, the way she performed this verse was next level. So high energy, so camp, so rock and roll, baby. This performance was hot. And over on the runway, Denny Beard is giving us a little 60s Valley of the Doll fantasy that is a lot of fun at first glance. The makeup, coat, and wig aspect of this, I am in love with. However, the closer she got to the camera, the more I could see those boots or boot covers or pants or whatever is under that sickening dress. And I started to not like the look. They totally threw me off. They're kind of baggy in the back and on the thighs in just not a good way. She even mentions one of the style references is Mars Attacks, iconic. So this is a tough situation for me because the overall presentation, I love, but the details of those boot pant things, her culottes, those are a rock. But the rest is definitely a hot. And finally, she's done peeing polite. <laughs> she's done being and also done peeing polite. It's Pixie, who comes into this challenge telling us in confessionals that she apparently is in the UK's number one drag girl group and something something about Tia Coffee. And I want to highlight about Pixie. She was responsible for the group's costumes. Everyone in this group was so cohesive and it really was each of them working together, bringing their different talents and strengths and skills that made this group so phenomenally good tonight. She sang, get rude, it's anarchy. In the UK, puns. I quit being polite, stepped into the sun. Excuse me, please, I've arrived. I tricked them out, but they might like it using only my thighs. <laughs> I was having flashbacks to that fast food commercial where they're at the order box and they're like, I'll have one thunder thighs, please. And Pixie did an amazing job, I think, of personalizing these lyrics and giving us something memorable to catch on to. Pixie polite. What else do those thighs do? This performance was hot. And over on the runway, the acid trip's not over. Pixie is giving us a beautiful pink and green neon jacket. And what is really special about this is I think that hourglass silhouette that she accomplished with just a coat. I love that she's got the matching gloves, hat, and shoes, head to toe. This look is so cool and also has that trendy, cool kid club vibe that I think I was really expecting from a category like Neon Knights. And usually about 10 inches is all I can take, but if she's offering 22, sure, why not? This look is hot. And now some tea and drama from Miss Pixie Polite. After the premiere aired, she tweeted this out about her entrance look. Fun fact, it was actually something I threw together a few days before leaving for Drag Race because what I had ordered arrived after I had already left for the race. That designer done effed up drag, so if you hate it, blame them. And after the premiere, Pixie was apparently getting some hate from Drag Race fans online. Fans do not send hate, by the way, don't do that. And took to Twitter on the 27th saying this, fat people are expected to be quiet and stay out of the spotlight. I'm not going to apologize for having something to say. If you think that makes me obnoxious, that's a you problem. And the more you compare me to other in the fandom that people have a problem with for being quote too much, maybe think about what queens like Eureka, Ginger, Silky, Candy, or even Lawrence have in common. You can't kill my confidence. And just while we're on the subject, the amount of thinly veiled fat phobia I have experienced in the last few weeks since Meet the Queens is mind boggling, but especially since episode one. And Lawrence Cheney jumped into this conversation as well, sharing her experience in conversations with Pixie that she had on Instagram DMs. Why do I need to send messages like this to plus size girls before they're announced? Grim, mate, grim. It won't change, but you'll grow stronger, Pixie. And in that screenshot, she had said to Pixie, you're a plus size like me. The fans don't like us for this reason, but they don't realize they are being like this. And I know it's not easy to address stuff like this, but I think it just shows how strong of a person Pixie is to be able to openly talk about it. And while we're on this subject, I want to encourage y'all to be a part of the solution and not the problem when you're interacting with people and queens online. Spread love, give hugs, and go tell Pixie Polite how damn fierce she is. Because love trumps hate. And that's on period ah, uh, period uh. <laughs> And finally, wrapping up on this episode, the Queens of the Bone Age get a group win and every member of the group gets a Rupita badge. But with all the good, there is also bad. In the bottom two, we've got John vs. Blonde and Starlight. But before I break down this lip sync, I want to remind y'all that I release exclusive videos every single week over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website. Where members get access to those exclusive weekly videos like reactions to RuPaul's Drag Race. And where members get early access to my main channel YouTube videos and access to the Bussy Queen Discord server. And you can join my Patreon by clicking the link in the description of this video and visiting patreon.com slash bussyqueen. Come have some fun with me. See you there. Concerning this lip sync though, as sad as the elimination 
question was, and as much as I did not want to see Starlet go, mostly because I know her unearned runways are going to be sickening as hell, it kind of was her time. It's just gonna take her time to learn how to emote to camera and how to really give that inner cute, fun, goofy uh, personality that I know she does have inside of her. But I sure am gonna miss that goofy little girl. Uh. And finally for my hottest hats. In the challenge, I'm going to give it to Lefil. And on the runway, I'll take a slice and give it to Cheddar Gorgeous. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest haunts and they've chosen Baby in the challenge and Cheddar Gorgeous on the runway. But I'd also love to hear from y'all. I love reading your comments. So let me know what y'all thought about this episode and who you think should have been in the bottom, gone home and won the challenge. See you later. Love ya. Bye. <sighs> Doesn't anyone just enjoy drag anymore? <coughs> Hi, Ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode four of Ru no, three of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. And today, some of our queens had the honor of winning the RuPaul Christmas ornament meme turned trophy in the inaugural NAFTA awards. I'll identify those winners as we go. And for the main challenge in runway, they were put into pairs and asked to create two high fashion runway looks using only the fabrics found in their big giant bingo boxes. Bingo. So we'll be breaking down each look and ranking the queens in pairs from rottest rat to hottest hot. Based on nothing but my completely invalid and incredible opinion. And then at the end of today's video, we'll be breaking down some unaired drama as spilled by our quietest but brightest UK starlet. Starlet. As it turns out, our goofy little girl had quite a lot to say over the past week concerning her elimination and how she thought she upset RuPaul, whose feet she painted, and more. And finally, we'll be recapping what the queens themselves thought about the episode, who were apparently facing a bit of blowback from the fan base. First up, all that glitters is not necessarily gold, as it turns out. At the bottom of my list tonight, we've got Cheddar Gorgeous and Copper Top, who were given the gold box. And they are collectively at the bottom of my list for one reason and one reason only. They really did not work together well as a team. Their two looks were the least cohesive of any pairing tonight, and one of them way outshined the other. Let's talk about it. First up, Copper Topper, who's a little bit pressed this episode because her peers have voted her best background actress in a non-speaking role, aka queen who has most faded into the background. I mean, girl, I'd be pressed, 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 pressed if my fellow drag race queens voted me that too, but as the other queens told her, they were asked to choose and she was the one they chose. Which is, yes, kind of ironic because of the queens in this cast, she is one of the louder ones and even wears outfits with words written on them. Like how the hell is someone like this fading into the background? And I think two things were going on with Copper Top in these three episodes. Primarily, I don't think the producers knew what exactly to do with her storyline. She's an extremely talented queen with a lot to offer, but my God, look at the cast. And of this cast, I think Copper struggled the most to really find her niche and brand herself to the judges. She just wasn't standing out. And her look tonight certainly didn't help with the problems that she was having in this competition. She is giving Drag Race Drag Queen staple, Barbarella, and ultimately missing that element of copper top. I'd even go as far to say that a queen saying their look is inspired by Barbarella in their confessional is as played out as me dressing like a sing queen. <laughs> If you can't read yourself, how the hell are you gonna read anybody else? But seriously, if Barbarella is so fierce and talented and every drag queen wants to be her, like, let's get her on Drag Race already. Barbarella for season 15, am I right? But worse than this look being a cliche reference, I think the way the bodysuit fits is a little questionable around those leg hems. And there's just too much going on with the top half of her look, the gold hair, the gold makeup, the cape. It's just a lot to look at and then nothing on the bottom. Just like I like it, ow. <sighs> nothing on the bottom but a white boot that that is that does not match the rest of the look or Cheddar's look. This look is a rat. But speaking of Miss Gorgeous, the alien deity of the competition, she in stark contrast to what Copper Top did on the runway tonight flawlessly executed her look. She absolutely is giving alien from space, but her own flavor. I love in particular the way that she has integrated some gold flakes into all the waves of that wig. And they're matching the gold flakes of the cape that's draped around her shoulders. This look though does suffer in some of the same ways that Copper's does. It is a little plain once you get down to the bottom part of the waist. And I don't understand the black boot just as much as I don't understand the solid white boot. I think it would have made a lot more sense for them to just make gold boot covers. Cause like, yeah, their capes are aligned, great. However, the boots just stick out like a sore thumb. But Cheddar's look at least makes sense for who she is as a drag character and has some more artistic inspiration than her teammate Coppers. So I would leave this look with like a very safe hat. But girl, Miss Cheddar did her teammate Copper real dirty letting her go out like that. Gotta say. And next up, Team Purple. 
Ooh, I put them second to bottom tonight for the sole reason of their looks being very uninspired. The queens were asked to make a pair of high fashion looks, but I don't think that they left the department store. Still, obviously better than me though, who never left Amazon.com. I don't want to see any more tucking H&M. Just kidding. It's, this is definitely a step above H&M, but only a step. And first in our group, we've got Danny Beard, who was awarded best scene stealing attention grabbing camera hog. <laughs> Honestly, not a bad thing to be awarded. And I think this would honestly boost my confidence in the competition because it shows the other queens are looking at you as someone who knows how to work the camera. So to Danny's credit, she does tell Rue in the workroom when she's doing her walkabouts that this is not really her thing, but neither was last week. And she did after all still participate in the winning group and get a repeater badge for a performance. Rue then tells this team to embellish their looks and make them more than simple, but I don't think they really listened other than adding these gold chains. Danny's look, while I would enjoy for I think let's say a hosting gig at a nightclub for a comedy show. I'm just not reading as high fashion or getting anything from either of these two's looks that says anything about their personalities. And they've almost got the exact same looks on. Denny's dress is a little skimpier though and rides up as she walks down the runway, which hey, could be a feature and it's not a bug, but I read it as she didn't quite get the dimensions of the dress right. So because she looks good, she just didn't for me meet the brief. I would leave this look with a warming up. And Pixie's in the exact same boat for me tonight. The only difference is like maybe if Danny's look was giving bridesmaid, Pixie's would be giving mother of the bridesmaid, or as Sminty would call it, old maiden. And in that sense, it was. It was just a little too long, and I think unnecessarily aged Pixie's drag character here. Not sure why they went for this mother daughter kind of thing. But again, this look is good, just not great for me. So I would leave it with a warming up. And next up, Team Mint green. Girl, that color, that color. Did they not camera test that color? Or maybe they did. Conspiracy theory time. And maybe they put that mint green color in there to sabotage whichever team got it. Just a thought. But let's break it down. They say their fashion inspiration here is Bottega Veneta. Remember, remember the 5th of November. Insert laugh track here. So Bottega Veneta, not something I've ever seen on Amazon, so I don't recognize it, but did they achieve that? Let's look at Jumper's look first, who RuPaul tells to her face in front of the rest of the girls and the pit crew that her name is terrible. Your drag name is terrible. Welcome to the club. <laughs> But Jombers, or Jay, as Rue is now calling her, comes out in one of the more successful looks, I think, of the night, or at least upper halves. I love that asymmetrical Xena kind of warrior princess fantasy that she has going on there, and the woven pieces of fabric that create that shoulder are really, really cool. I'm not super in love with the wet hair or the boring part of the bottom part of the outfit, so this is kind of like a half rot, half hot situation for me, because I think she really was a victim more of the color of the fabric than anything else. And her teammate, Black Peppa, who was voted beast in show by her peers, aka exhibits the most star quality, both struggled in was successful in the same way Jombers was tonight. It was Black Peppa's idea to do the weaving of this fabric and the ambition that thought required. Wow, I love that. And of all the looks, I think she had the best idea. It really just was a lack of time tonight that prevented Peppa from executing her vision. She's walking down the runway and ends up with the zipper of the skirt that was originally on the back on the front somehow. Easy access at least. And the top part of her dress is literally just falling off of her body. Her look though, despite its technical flaws, I would still give a safe three flame hot because I would rather see a queen or pair of queens in a case like this reach for the moon and land somewhere in the stars rather than serve something predictable and boring, even if predictable and boring fits and doesn't fall off. Next up, team, I'm blue. Da -ba -dee -da -ba -da. Think about that song every morning at the bus stop. And team blue is comprised of sminty drop in the fill. A pairing I particularly enjoyed watching interacts tonight because we've got, as she's voted by her peers, this chaotic hot mess of energy meets the refined, calm, and collected the fill. Let's look at Sminty Drops look first, which is one of my favorites of the night. I absolutely love that thigh high sparkly stocking, which matches the sparkly blue opera glove that she's got on. The contrast of all that sparkle and glitter playing in those runway lights works really, really well against the less exciting and softer blue fabric that makes the dress skirt and top part of her look. Also, did y'all catch that frame of Sminty outlining her head on the fabric, like by laying on the floor? Literally me if I ever had to design something. This look is very 90s supermodel meets almost like 20s kind of swimwear flapper fantasy. I just think she did an excellent job showing skin where it counted, but also covering up skin or parts of her body where it counts like with the head wrap. Just another drop of fashion into the pool of sminty hot. 
Mess, that is. Hot mess, that's what her teammates voted her. I didn't say that. I'm a hot mess. Woof. I'm always a mess, and I've never pretended to be anything less. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much. And Sminty's partner, the Phil, looks equally effortlessly chic. And they, I think, did a really great job of making themselves look like two pieces from the same fashion collection, but giving very different fashion eras. I'm getting I Dream of Genie vibes from the Phil's look, which I love. And as literally all of the judges praised her for, I also want to recognize all of the rouging elements, the way that top crop top fits. And I also like that she's got a different flavor of head wrap on. This look though, next to Sminty's, I will say, I feel like is missing a bit of that blue glitter Fabric. I just wanted a few more peeps of that, maybe on her hands, or maybe sewn to the lining of her cape or something, which, yes, would have taken her a lot more time to do, so I definitely understand why she did it. I will also say that because these two have such a dramatic height difference, it probably would have been a little bit better if LaFille's silhouette in the bottom part of that dress had opened up on the side like Sminty's, just to give her body a little more height. But again, small critiques, and I definitely dream of LaFille. This look is hot. And the blue team, for me, was beaten only by by the black team comprised of Dakota Schiffer and Baby. And these two are an excellent pairing as well. You can tell they both love fashion. I don't know a thing about it, but they are talking about Richard Quinn, the 90s, and all kinds of silly little names and decades that I don't know about. I think these two also worked super well for each other because they are very much in personality foils of each other. Dakota is more soft-spoken and careful with her fashion and ideas, and Baby is more energetic, confident, and willing to, as we see on the runway show a bit more skin than Dakota is. Let's first dive into the details of Baby's look. Who's giving main pop girl diva Ariana Grande? Which did kind of catch me off guard because they were playing that clip in the workroom of her showing off just the skirt part of the outfit with nothing else. And it does look a kind of frumpy, but that final effect is flawless. Like girl, if that was giving bin bag realness, I'll be the bin. Where's the sign up list? But yeah, I love her miles of legs that she is showing off. And I love how she's showing off the contrasting fabric pattern in different ways than her partner Dakota. And I think there's just something about those two trails of fabric coming off as a sort of train on the back of her dress are really fresh and fun. Another number one hit for Ben Maybe, but who's surprised? This look is hot. And Dakota, like her personality, is giving a softer side of this look, but still keeping it flirty with the shortcut of the dress skirt. And spicy, I think, with the way her hair curls are just like sitting on top of her head. Again, I think it was really, really smart of these girls to use this fabric to help emphasize how great these looks were. Because as we have seen on RuPaul's Drag Race, doing an all black look can be very dangerous in the runway lights. You run the risk of losing texture and silhouette, but using the right compliments, you can emphasize how powerful the LBD can be. I don't need to tell y'all twice, but this look is hot. And the win tonight, no surprise, is given to Baby and Dakota. And this was definitely judging I agreed with. I think the only competition against them really were Sminty and LaPhil, who definitely gave two cohesive fashion looks. However, Team Baby and Dakota just felt a touch more modern, which I think pushed them to the finish line for me. But when we start to talk about bottoms for this episode, I... I am a little confused about what happens. They always do this on Drag Race. They'll be like, here's a group challenge, but we're gonna judge you individually. Or here is a completely individualistic challenge, but we're gonna judge you as a group. I feel like we definitely learned more than anything as seasoned viewers of RuPaul's Drag Race that group challenges are often just an excuse for the producers to step in and to maybe redirect the season. And of course they see more fit for how it's playing out. And tonight we see Black Peppa and Copper Top plucked from their pairings and put in the bottom two together. And if this were Bussy Queen's drag race, we would have Copper Top and Cheddar Gorgeous lip syncing tonight. But it's not. Concerning Peppa and Copper's lip sync though, I did react to it over on my Patreon as part of my new podcast called The Bus Stop. Beep, beep. The Bus Stop is a Patreon exclusive podcast that I've just started and I'm having so much fun with. It's made up of my reactions to the best moments of each episode of Drag Race and also both personal and drag behind the scenes updates. It's fun, relaxed, we talk, we chat, spill the tea, and and sip the tea. And again, you can get access to The Bus Stop, my new Patreon exclusive podcast, by clicking the link in the description of this video and visiting patreon.com slash bussyqueen. See you there. <laughs> the slip sync though, good God, did we witness a murder? Black Peppa went in on this. I felt like I was back watching the lip sync between Denali and Kimura Hall. Like that is how much of a serve Black Peppa's lip sync was. She was giving all the splits, all the drops, and in ways that made sense with the music. And she had me guessing at every moment what she would do because she kept switching up her energy. And that is what I think truly makes a great lip sync. Don't get me wrong though, I don't think Copper Top did bad in this lip sync. It's just that she needed to do a hell of a lot more than that to beat Black Peppa. I seriously could have watched an hour 
more of Black Peppa doing that lip sync. <laughs> so Miss Copper Top or Copper Bottom this episode does go home. And on Twitter, she left the fans with this message. I feel very sad, but very proud. And some of her sisters like Black Peppa quote tweeted and wrote, so proud of what we did. Just May wrote, didn't she bloody smash it? What an icon. And Dakota wrote, I love Copper Top Queen so much. All sentiments I agree with. I certainly don't think that she had a bad showing on RuPaul's Drag Race. My God, the talent level of this season is just, I think something that we have just never seen the likes of before. That said, I'm sure it was not easy to be voted fading into the background by your peers and go home on that same episode. So y'all make sure to go send her some love on social media. She deserves it. And finally, concerning our queen's reactions to the fan base reacting to the episode. Pixie Polite said, mad seeing people's opinions on this week's episode. Cause in the room, we all agreed with placements, but some of y'all really watching 17 different versions of the show based on who your quote faves are. LaPhil wrote, the design challenge is so important cause it's the only time when queens have to rely on their own skills and vision, no stylus, no budgets. Black Pepper wrote, with the vision I had, I under estimated the time. Nonetheless, I wouldn't change a thing. Enjoy the show. P.S. Thank you, Danny Beard, for the white heels. And Sminty wrote, defending her look, everyone saying I was just wearing a two-piece. Like, do you know how hard it is to make gloves and stockings out of non-stretch fabric, let alone sequin? And considering there was a lot of fan discussion about how, quote, plain some of the looks were, I did want to remind y'all that the boxes of fabric given to the queens were actually just plain themselves, because after all, the runway category high fashion was intended more to show up outfit construction and understanding of fashion than it was, like let's say a traditional design challenge where the goal is to be more avant-garde. So with all that in mind, make sure y'all go give some love to our queens who are putting on an ultra fabulous season. Now onto the dragon drama of our little starlet. First, I want to recap her interview she did with the Drag Race yearbook video and that she told the host why she black that she really did not know anything about Jerry Hallowell or the Spice Girls. Oh my God. And also reminisced on some of the olden days of Drag Race where it did feel like the runway maybe counted for closer to 50% of the judgments. I think over time, there was a time when looks were highly favored on Drag Race. Like it's of course going to evolve over time. They look for different things each season. Each season has its own flavor. And it, apparently it just wasn't this season. <laughs> And she also revealed that the reason she was chosen for Black Peppa's team on the episode she was eliminated was because in episode one, she had helped Black Peppa paint her feet pink for the Mr. Blobby look. So when she was getting ready for Blobby, I was completely ready as Patsy, ready to go. And she was struggling last minute to paint her feet pink. And I was like, let me go help my angel. So she was like, Starlet painted my feet pink, so she's going to be in my group. Blobby, 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 Blobby. She also did an interview with Digital Spy where they asked her questions like, what was going through your minds during that lip sync. She said, the best way I would describe it, comparing it to how Valentina described it, it feels like you're not doing it and you're sitting and watching, that kind of thing. And she also clarified what happened with her elimination exit line. She said, when I walked off, there was a moment they made me worry a bit. I said my exit line at the front of the stage and then I walked off and I was really emotional. I just needed to get off camera because I was about to completely break down and I did the second I got off the stage. There are times when some queens walk off in a huff or they're pissed off and they kind of miff off all the judges and the judges pull a face like they were rude. The contestant was rude. And RuPaul kind of had this weird expression when I walked off the stage. I was worried that she thought I was being disrespectful or rude or ungrateful. So I would maybe say to her, that's not what I was doing. I was just really, really, really emotional and I was completely heartbroken. And finally, for hottest hots in this design challenge, I'm going to give my team hottest hots to Baby and Dakota. And I'll also award the individual hottest hot of this runway to Baby. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots and they, no surprise, also chose Baby and Dakota. And the individual hottest Hottest hot of this runway, Dakota. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye. So what do we think? Do we like my definitely not supposed to be Gengar spooky Halloween sweater? Hi, ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we'll be reviewing episode four of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. Today, our prissy little pussycats improv skills were challenged on the Caddy Man talk show hosted by Alan Carr. And the runway category was main event look meant to showcase fabulous hair. And to quote Lady Gaga the Great, this is my hair. So we'll be breaking down each queen's performance in the challenge and their look on the runway. And then at the end of today's video, we'll be going over some new drama with Bimini Bon Boulash. She's done being silent and is finally taking a stand for herself on Twitter. Now let's untangle this mess strand by strand. First up, we'll cover the three queens in the group Curiosity Killed the Katrina. This team was made up of Pixie, Cheddar, and Danny. And firstly, I know I don't need to tell y'all this, but they were so damn good. So good, in fact, they made the other teams look 
a little like amateur hour. And I definitely respect the strategy of what Pixie did when making these teams, but it was pretty obvious that they were the three strongest theatrical performers in the group. And the challenge as a whole might have played out a little bit better had she spread out some of that stronger energy. I guess we can't blame her for playing the game though. In the actual sketch, her character was Katrina, the dead cat that the character Cheddar Gorgeous was playing had evidently pushed to her death. And Pixie did a great job, not only looking, but acting like the roadkill she was supposed to be. And her character's chaotic, messy energy, I think was a great foil to Cheddar's more serious approach to this improv challenge. So she absolutely gets a hot from me. But you know who is even better? Danny Beard. <laughs> To quote Cheddar Gorgeous, that was so shady when she did that nuntucked. Love that messiness for her. But back to them in just a minute. First, let's talk about Pixie's runway where she was giving Venus, goddess of the glam show. I can't believe Lady Gaga not only inspired this runway category, but Pixie's actual runway. What an icon. And firstly, yes, I do think this look is really pretty. The placement of all the pearls is really well done. I love the flowiness of that fabric, contrasting that tight bodysuit, and the camp factor of having the glam shell have no pearls in it was a really funny detail. But I've got to say, when she turned that corner, she really caught me off guard because I was expecting hair everywhere and she gave it only in one place, her head. How's your hair? Head. I'm just not sure that I ever would have guessed this runway category from the look. It feels more like they were told to feature hair rather than construct a look of hair in some cases as we'll see tonight. And I do love being surprised. So I'm gonna give this look a hot. And next up, grab a slice, it's Cheddar Gorgeous. And her performance was interesting. She starts their group off and is giving this very dramatic, kind of self-indulgent monologue. It felt a little out of place, but then again, Cheddar does often feel a little out of place with her alien deity persona thing that she's always doing. That said, I did actually really enjoy it once I kind of got used to it and it clicked what she was doing. It seems though the judges telescope into her performance couldn't see the planet she was on, and she got a little bit of critique from them for kind of being disconnected and too theatrical in the improv. But honestly, I think she deserved a little more recognition. Recognition. I mean, after all, she was one of the only ones to actually start a cat fight in the catty talk show thing. Like, hello? Teleport me to Planet Cheddar. This was hot. And on the runway, we're all mad, I suppose. I sure am. She's giving us a little Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland homage, but make it furry. I love what she did here with the artistry and the makeup. She did a great job, I think, of blending that human and animal element together. And I can't say I love being reminded of the nightmare fuel that Cats the movie is, the recent one, but she really did an excellent job on this. I will say though, it wasn't perfect for me. I think there maybe was a slight mismatch in the color matching with the bodysuit and then the pink tones and the fur that she did. And God forbid I say anything about a boot on a runway review section of this video, but I didn't love the boot. I wanted a little fur on it. Doesn't anyone just enjoy drag anymore? Ah, oh, this look is Next up, our first out in musical chairs today, Danny Beard. So in the challenge, her character is called Mystic Mog and she is the psychic reconnecting Pixie and Cheddar. This was a really bizarro performance from her and that is really what I think made it work. Plus she's got a great chemistry with Alan and I think they did a good job together kind of breaking the wall as soon as the sketch started when Alan calls her out for the comedy teeth that she's wearing. Was that scripted though? I don't know. And that was actually a question I found myself asking several different times throughout their specific challenge performance. It was almost too clean and too well rehearsed feeling, or it was at least edited that way for it to truly feel like an improv performance for me. But to be clear, I'm not complaining. I'm just confused at like how excellent these three did together. And Danny truly was the glue of this group and she absolutely gets a hat for me. Hot glue. And over on the runway, Danny's giving dog walker mommy and daddy. This is very pick the kids up from school at three, 80s hairband practice at five. I immediately thought of Alyssa Edwards' interpretation of this very similar type of look back on season five when I saw it. And it's cute for what it is. But for Danny, I will say we have seen the white face and box silhouette pretty much every week from her on the runway so far. And I'm kind of getting bored with it. I think especially for this being the hair runway, our bearded queen probably should have emphasized her beard in some way. The look itself certainly is not a 
bad one. I'm just not super excited by it. So I'm gonna leave it at a warming. Ah. Next, I'm moving into team two. Cat's got my tongue. Tongue in question? Dakota's. She's playing the character of Tabitha, who has it somehow, we later learn through Lefil, through a black hole of sorts, swapped tongues with Baby's character. It's a very convoluted story, honestly. It wasn't explained well, and I think the characters were kind of strange overall. That said, I really did enjoy Dakota in her group, the most of her group. I think she really is starting to relax in Drag Race, and the more relaxed she is, the more confident she is, and all of that really does show through here. She allows everybody to laugh with her as she's kind of stumbling over the lines that she's saying in this like street winch voice. Again though, what was really going on with this storyline? I'm not totally sure, but I enjoyed what she did. So I'm gonna give her a hi. And over on the runway, she is gone with the wind. She's actually giving us Moschino, Galliano, Grandma. Grandma's doll collection, but wrapped in a curtain. And this was another runway tonight that I was like, hair? Wear. Then we can kind of see how she has transformed the idea of doing a hair runway a little bit and created a wig out of what would have been like a curtain tassel. It didn't really give me hair. I wanted bigger, better, more exciting hair. That said, the look is very Dakota. It's elegant, simple, and very pretty. I like the shapes and silhouette that she's created here. I would certainly give it a hot in like a curtain category or something. I just don't understand really how this made hair the main event. So I'm going to leave it at a warming up. Next up, is that a croissant in her stockings or is she just happy to see us? It's LaFille. And in the improv challenge, she plays Dr. Laffy line, a character name that was really tailor made for her. But unfortunately, it seems like the actual role wasn't. Her performance in this was chaotic all over the place. And she seems very dear in the headlights when she's actually on stage. It's very messy. There was even a part where I think she was actually supposed to prompt the hairball situation that the other two girls did. But Alan Carr, I think, noticed is that she's kind of losing her step and pace in the sketch and he prompts that event. And Alan doing this made me realize this group in general was very disjointed. It felt like all three of them were just kind of doing their own thing and not interacting with each other very well. So yeah, I'd send this doctor back to med school or vet school or whatever school it is that treats human cats. This was a and over on the runway, call the plumber because girl, the drain has been LaFilled with hair. And you know, the judges really ate this look up. I think it's good and bad. I <laughs> The colors I think are very pretty. I like the movement in it and the shape overall is good. She certainly has created a look made out of hair. And for that, I think she deserves some praise. LaFille is basically supposed to be the drag queen that got stuck in your shower drain. Let me go check mine real quick. Oh, and LaFille also has a wig reveal on this runway. Why though, I don't know. Mm. I just don't really care for a wig reveal personally unless it's revealing to something that really enhances a look or there's a reason that it's happening. So hot for the category, but I would probably use Drano on this look. It's just not to my personal taste. So gonna get a soft. Next up, baby, baby, baby. Ah. It's Baby, who in the challenge fails to be funny. And we saw her struggle with this a little bit last week when she was accepting her NAFTA award, but realized what she was doing then and snapped out of it, then said something funny by saying she wasn't funny. And maybe she should have tried something like that here because there's like a seriousness, I think, in her improv performance that was keeping some of us from laughing. And by some of us, I mean all of the queens in the room, Alan Carr, and probably everybody watching at home. There were two things working very hard against her here. The first being the storyline of these three characters. It was confusing to try to comprehend what the hell was happening. And the second being her relatively quiet or uninteractive teammates. She has needed somebody else, I think, to act as her straight man character, as you will, to allow us to laugh. But then again, she really didn't do that good. So yeah, I probably would give this performance a but I don't think I would have put her in the bottom for this. More on that later. And on the runway, we do again see this storyline happening where Baby is not doing so good. Because we see the judges kind of go in on this look. Rue says that it's simple and really needed more. And then in Untuck, we see the moment where the other girls are telling Baby that the judges are really just trying to push her, yada yada. And I'm saying all that because I really was shocked at how critical the judges were, specifically on her runway. When she came out, I was honestly stunned. She was one of the only queens of the cast to have an entirely made of hair outfit with a clear concept. She says she's giving black hair, black culture, and black beauty, really feeling herself and proudness on the runway, and I think it shone through. Was it totally without issue? 
no. I think she maybe could have added some gold applique to her skin under the braids to give a little more contrast and match the gold detailing on the cage skirt part of the dress. But again, that's me looking for small enhancements to make. I don't think that there was a big issue here. This look was certainly hot. And finally, team three in the sketch, Catfish out of the bag, which actually should have just been called Cat Got Your Tongue 2, considering how Sminty's performance went. First up though, let's talk about Black Peppa, who is really gonna miss Ginger, and I will too. <laughs> I lost it when she said that. I'm gonna miss Ginger talking about Copper Top, who literally had an entire storyline about fading into the background and then Black Peppa doesn't remember her name. I live for Drag Race moments like this. Anyways though, in the challenge, Peppa plays the character of Lucky, who is the bride-to-be to her, as it turns out, catfish. And the character choice she makes here is to add a really thick accent into everything that she says, which worked really well. I think it kind of caught Alan off guard. And Peppa by herself, I think, did an excellent job. She was a great team lead. But as we'll see here in a second, the other two just didn't really match the energy that she was giving. So then it started to get more awkward as time went on. Peppa though, I do think was hot. And over on the runway, oh, Every time I see Miss Black Peppa hit the runway stage, I just remember how blessed I am to have her on my screen and how I'll never be that tall or pretty or able to pull looks like that off. She looks amazing. I don't need to tell y'all that. This is another look constructed of all hair. Thank you so much for doing that on the hair runway. And specifically, I think the headpiece that she is wearing is my favorite item on the runway tonight. The design of the color choice and silhouette, everything is so phenomenal. She is golden. She is sparkling absolutely beautifully. <laughs> And next up, Sminty Draw, who like a moth to flame met her bitter end tonight. And Sminty, I could tell, probably was not going to do well in this challenge based on the storyline they were building throughout the early parts of the episode. She was getting lots of confessionals. And then we hear her talk about how she thinks her chaotic energy will be good for an improv challenge, which told me, oh God, she's gonna flop. And there really is not anything else to say about her character besides she gave nothing except a twerk. <laughs> But yeah, she missed every single opportunity thrown her way by everyone else on stage. And you could visibly see the pain and suffering that she was feeling as she realized what was happening, but unfortunately couldn't claw her way out. So I'm going to give this performance obviously a rot. But wow, did she more than make up for it on the runway. Unfortunately though, as we have definitely found out this season, the look is not 50% of the mark. In fact, I guess it's zero. Cause this look, even as the judges remark, is phenomenal. It's beautiful. The details are amazing. I love that she made the hair the main event of this moth look. The pigtail pieces making up the antenna are absolutely stunning and visually interesting to look at. And I love the fur around the top part of it. I will say though, it did in a way feel very Instagram ready because it was so detailed and finessed from the waist up and the legs, she just did white stockings and plain white heels. Definitely not too mad about though. This look is absolutely hot. I also loved Rue finding out on this runway four episode in that she's part of the house of Kindle. Can you do the thing? I just know Rue had no idea what she was even saying when she said that the producer just told her to ask. And for our final kitty cat on the catwalk tonight, we've got Jomber's Blonde. In the challenge, she plays the character of Claudia, and it was funny to see her come out with such high energy, very ready to do this sketch. She knew exactly who she was and how she was gonna do it. And God, there was just a brick wall from Sminty and then Black Peppa just kind of doing her own thing. Her character was almost so eager that it was off-putting compared to the low energy of her two partners. I think even Alan was kind of caught off guard, but I did really enjoy what she did. It was just a shame she didn't have the team to back her up. So this performance was hot, but let's look at what was going on over on the runway. This was a look I did not get. I didn't know the reference, but when I did a little tappity tap on my keyboard and pulled up the Google search results. Yeah, definitely giving Rain Spencer with the fur coat even to boot. She nailed the hairstyle and there definitely is hair everywhere, not only on her head, but on the coat and the fur bikini that she's got on underneath that coat. That was part of the look though that I'm still kind of scratching my head about. I think maybe she was just trying to maybe make fun of the fact that a British socialite would never wear something that skimpy. Or maybe there's a photo of Rain Spencer in a look like this that I'm not aware of. But something about the combination of things she was doing on the runway just felt a little 
confusing overall, even after seeing the reference. But I would leave this with a warming up. So the win this week goes to, shocking twist, one of our group one members. And I was kind of sitting there thinking, why are we giving just one win out? I don't know, the first group was so good, so phenomenal. I kind of think that they critiqued Cheddar Gorgeous a little bit just to justify maybe not giving out three wins again, especially because we did just have two group challenge wins two weeks prior. Bruce said, I'm cutting the girls off. We're only doing one Rue Peter badge this week, even though they all deserved it. And I stand by that. And overall, I did enjoy this challenge, but it was pretty stark how good the first group was compared with the other two. The other two felt like they had never seen or did not understand what improv was or is supposed to be. And I kind of wondered watching the episode if that wasn't why the challenge person was so short, because think back to, for example, the fairy tale justice episode from All Star 7. It felt like that improv challenge went on for 10 or 15 minutes for both of those groups. But here we had three different groups finish their challenge in like less than 10 minutes. I don't know, just food for thought, but bottom two today goes to Sminty and Baby. I don't necessarily agree with putting Baby in the bottom as I mentioned, because nobody puts Baby in the bottom. But is it justifiable? Sure. I just think that Baby overall had a better grasp on what she was doing in the improv challenge than her partner LaPhil who got completely lost and needed a lot of help from Alan. But this lip sync goes kind of how you would expect. I did react to it over on my Patreon along with some other great moments from the episode in episode three of The Bus Stop, my Patreon exclusive podcast where we hang out, spill some tea, chit chat, and react. It's a lot of fun and you can get access to The Bus Stop by clicking the link in the description of my video to join my Patreon at patreon.com slash buzzyqueen. See you there. Now on to Bimini Bond breaking her silence. On Twitter last week, she was going off, starting with this tweet. She wrote, people on Reddit are so toxic. Someone sent me all the stuff that people are saying. Babes, my mom is Scottish and dad is from London. None of my family are from Norfolk, but I was raised there, yes. I've never had a Norfolk accent. My nan and granddad lived in Clapham. Did I say that right? And to this tweet, she attached a screenshot of a Reddit thread where people were writing in reference to Bimini. I thought she dropped the accent. How's it become even more of a caricature. Who, Bimini? Yeah, she's from Norwich. She dropped it for a while after her season, particularly the Vogue video and stuff. Now she's back talking like my mom, starring in Chitty Bang Bang. Probably just nerves. A lot of queens that move to East London adapt that voice. It's just slightly offensive. She later elaborated about her mother and their relationship, saying, she was a tiller girl in the West End and he was a director of theaters. Say what you want, but I'm sick of this constant attempt to bring a queer person down, get a life. And Bimini later tweeted, my parents split up when I was young. My mom was a single parent for a minute and worked as a hairdresser dresser full-time to show me a work ethic that I'm so happy I got to see. I work damn hard because of her and I get to buy her stuff I always dreamed of because she deserves it for everything she provided for me. Say what you want. I'm working class getting to do things I always dreamed of. You can never take away my roots and I'll never change who I am, but I'll continue to work my A off to give my family what they deserve. I can't wait to share my story with you all. The last 18 months since this show have been incredible, but I've encountered so many snakes. I've been sued, lied to, heartbroken by people I thought were my friends. People are fine with you until you start to succeed. I'm so grateful for my life and everything I got to do, but it has come at a price. I'm in a place where I'm happy now, but this year I have been the unhappiest I've ever been. I'm done with the fake people. I'm going to continue to do what I do, and if you're real, then I'll F with you. And to that tweet, we saw a response from Tace, so many snaky snakes, and even Nikki Dahl writing, removing the stink and toxic from your life is always painful, but you come out so much happier in the end. And Priyanka even responded in a quote tweet writing, relatable material, people stay awful and get lost in their own agendas while using you. She also tweeted, it out lol what's this bs about me rude and disrespectful to staff at venues someone please confirm where when and who because that couldn't be less true people really be jumping lately which might have been a reference to this reddit screenshot she posted later where they wrote in reference to someone else calling bimini wholesome they weren't wholesome when they slammed a door in my face or the multiple times they've been rude to my staff or performers for just trying to do their jobs lol it always gets my back up when those with more money power privilege try and play the victim when they victimize others on the daily for no reason all of this merch stuff could have been handled better too, rather than leaving the fans that support you the most out of pocket. To which she directly responded, writing, who is this toasted crumpet? Because this is a lie. Firstly, I never have slammed a door in someone's face. Secondly, I'm not a rude person and have never treated staff or performers like this. If this is true, name the event, performers and venues, stop lying, it's pathetic and vile. And then in this Twitter thread, she clarified what was going on with her merch situation, which from what I understand has been a bit of a nightmare for her and fans and everyone involved since she left the season and set up her store. The merch situation is 
terrible, but finally I can legally pay back the refunds from people that want them. FYI, I am paying it all back from my money that I haven't made profit from. I have tried as hard as I could to sort this all out from what I could legally talk about it. Another FYI, I haven't been sued by a fan. If anyone has noticed, I haven't sold any more merch online due to this since my merch shop got shut without my knowledge over 15 months ago. I am genuinely so sorry about this, and I want to say it had been such a negative experience with my career and I never wanted this to happen. I never wanted my fans to go through a situation like this when they were wanting to support me, but I also never thought I'd go through a situation where I put my trust in people that took advantage, used, and sued me. I've somehow managed to maintain and thrive despite so many behind the scenes attempts to bring me down because I valued myself and my artistry more than the people around me. The fans' refunds are happening as I type this. I love my fans and I'm so thankful for all the support and I really hope that they can move past this and please understand I couldn't say this and I probably still shouldn't be, but I'm done being silent about a lot of things. I'm sorry and I can't deny how awful it was. For all those that have supported me, I love you. So there we have it. She's cleared the air and spilled the tea. And I will say, we often see people get stuck in situations where the fan or public response is for them to immediately respond. However, that's typically the first thing that lawyers, if they're involved, say not to do. And obviously it would suck either way to be her in this terrible situation or a fan who thought that they were supporting a queen they loved and used their hard-earned money that they lost. It's a tough situation, but I'm happy she's been able to clear everything up and can get everything in her life back on track. Now finally, back to UK4, I'm gonna go ahead and get my hottest hot on the runway to Smitty Drop, which unfortunately is the last time that I can say that. And my patrons, who I also asked to vote for their favorite runway tonight, voted for Sminty Drop as well. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye. Our inner demons are closer than you think. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today we'll be reviewing Drag Race UK Season 4, Episode 5. Just when you think it's too big, it isn't. Our queens were challenged to sing live in Larry Poppins' The Rusical, the twisted tale of Mary's evil twin. <laughs> I'm, by the way, Bussy King's evil twin, if you didn't catch that yet. In the runway category was West End Wonders. Looks inspired by iconic musical characters. West End, by the way, is like London's Broadway. And before we even get into the details of it all, I just have to say, wow, what an episode. The talent, it jumped out. So we'll be breaking all of that down, and then at the end of the video, we'll be taking a look at an interview Sminty did with Digital Spy concerning her exit and how the judges are treating runways this season. Now, let's break a leg. Or two. In the order they hit the runway today, first up, we've got Pixie Polite, and she had quite the showing this episode, starting off by winning the reading challenge. This gets her the ability to assign roles for this rusical, and I think she did a pretty good job casting everyone except, obviously, herself. She has a bit of a moment in the workroom while well, everyone is rehearsing their lines and it seems she is realizing that the role she's given herself, Larry Poppins, is not actually the one she wanted. And we don't get much more explanation behind why she wanted to make that last minute switch aside from saying, it's not the part I thought it was. Which makes me wonder what in the hell she thought it was. <laughs> Regardless though, Danny does go ahead and switch with her, ending her up in the role of Lick Van D. And her actual performance as LVD, I thought was really solid. This is a role, though, that I think is harder to put your own stamp on or elevate because doing something too crazy in this sort of narrator role, I think, runs the risk of distracting from what little plot there is in a rusical. Overall, I don't think she could have done a hotter job sweeping the chimneys in this rusical, but I do think she maybe sabotaged herself a little bit by not keeping that starring role. And over on the runway, she is giving us a double feature of Tracy Turnblad from the musical Hairspray, first in her school uniform, which reveals to to a cute little black and white cocktail dress. And Pixie tells us this was her choice because Tracy is a character that she looks up to for self-confidence and body positivity. I also thought thematically this was a really interesting runway choice for Pixie considering in this episode we do see her struggling with her confidence. She's not sure which role she should take and there's even a weird moment when she's getting critiques where Michelle almost out of nowhere, I think there was just a weird cut in the edit, she's complimenting Pixie saying Tracy Turnblad is iconic, you have the attitude that's what we need when we think of Tracy and then it cuts to you can't go back you gotta stop with this BS this is not the place for it like it was seriously such a jarring cut with no context and I feel like it must have only been included to give an editorial justification I guess to why Pixie didn't ultimately get the win but that's just a theory an evil twin theory <laughs> good morning Baltimore this look is 
Blondes. And next up, Jombers, J Blondes. In the challenge, she is the bird lady. You know the one. Up on the rooftops, feeding the pigeons, selling her body. Two piece and a biscuit, anyone? And this character was one of my personal favorites tonight. It was so bizarre, so out there, and she is such a ham. Crawling around on all fours, all of the bird noises, completely acted a fool on that stage, and it was exactly what she needed to do for a role like that. And while her role was not a super significant one in terms of plot of this rusical, this was a show-stealing performance. This bird flew the cuckoo's nest, and this performance gets a and over on the runway, she is singing in the rain, singing in the rain. She's paying homage to singing in the rain. Except, make it fashion. But is it fashion? Michelle didn't think so. However, I did enjoy her interpretation of what in the movie and musical is really just a plain yellow raincoat trench coat. She said fashion is a raincoat, tear it apart. And I do agree a little bit with Michelle. It might have been a little bit better to see that full cage hoop skirt come on both sides. But I think visually, speaking, there are some really good moments on this look, like that gorgeous hat that's see-through that has little raindrop crystals coming down, and the silhouette that she's created here from a, remember, raincoat inspiration is really unique and also unique to John Burr's so far. She's been really interesting every week on the runway, and I had fun with this, so I'm gonna give this a <laughs> Also, did y'all gag when RuPaul called out her lip size? What is with Rue? That's like her new thing, because she did that to Lady Camden, too. She's obsessed, obsessed with the paper-thin lips like I have. <laughs> And next up, this bin juice is lit AF. It's Black Peppa. She ends up in the role of the twins with Dakota. And honestly, killed it. Like she had no reason to perform the house down boots in this supporting role like this so hard. She nailed every moment of choreo. Every single line was funny. She was giving this little baby voice effect to some of the things that she said that added even more comedy. And watching her professionalism in this role, I was reminded like this is how it should feel to watch an actor. Someone who is really, really good at their craft. You forget who they are as a person and you're just in this role, this character that they have created. She did a great job at that. This performance was hot. And over on the runway, this line is not sleeping tonight because she is prowling on the catwalk. This look is phenomenal. She is giving us the circle of life. In the musical of Lion King, the characters do wear lion heads like Black Peppa has on hers. So her homage here is very true to the source material and also really unique to her. Y'all know I love Black Peppa. She could walk out on the runway in a mother tucking diaper and I would probably eat it up but this really is a lot of fun. And the other thing I really like about this look is it reminds me how ambitious Black Peppa is on the runway. She has had the hugest headpieces and we can see this one kind of tilting to the side. I'm sure it was near impossible to situate correctly, especially with her crawling all over the stage, but you gotta admire the dedication there. This look is Hakuna Mahara. Next up, Dakota Shipper, who lets us know this episode that she hates musicals and has never seen Mary Poppins. And honestly, I don't know how she escaped childhood without somebody playing Mary Poppins for her. I feel like it was always on for me, like at the daycare or my house because I was watching it over and over. And like, I can't say I can recall every detail of the plot when I watched it as a kid, but I do know that a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, among other things. And when casting is happening for the Rizgul, she does let them know that she doesn't want to be one of the twins. However, she ends up in the role of twins anyways, when they do a sort of audition for a French accent. I against Cheddar Gorgeous, who apparently can pronounce croissant with the best of them. Her performance though, as one of the twins, as the judges said, really wasn't bad. Nobody stumbled too hard today. She just was a little stiffer than some of the other girls and compared to Black Peppa, she was a little lower on the energy scale. Like there are some pretty clear spots when, especially she's dancing next to Peppa, where Peppa is hitting that choreo just a little harder and really giving it to the judges. So I understand the decision that happened there. So this performance I would leave with a warming up and over on the runway. She gives Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl, not to be confused with Starlet and Goofy Girl. And I think the thing about Dakota's fashion that is becoming more and more apparent every week is she has a perspective on who she is and what she wants to look like on stage. Because girl, there's one thing Miss Dakota will do is pay homage to the 60s, unless that homage in question is watching Mary Poppins, which is from the 60s. Dakota? Anyway, this runway tonight is sweet. It's exactly what you'd expect from Dakota. And you know, consistency is not a bad thing. This look is hot. And next up, grab a slice. It's Shutter Gorge. Yes. 
In the challenge, as I just mentioned, she auditioned and won the part of Rochelle the Roach. Cheddar gave French and Dakota gave French fry. And I'll say of this array of musical characters tonight, I think Cheddar had the best visual presentation. And I'm not sure how much of that was Cheddar adding her own spice and flavor to this costume, because I'm pretty sure that they are all given the costumes they wear. But I 100% was believing the cockroach fantasy. However, the actual performance she gave was not as good as she looked to me. I felt like it was missing some punches and this was a feature role and not a feature role that I was sitting there laughing at or thinking, wow, this is amazing. Like I did a couple of the others. She just sort of did her part and the musical moved on. And we did see something similar going on with Cheddar when the girl group was happening. I think choreo is not necessarily her forte. This cockroach would definitely survive the rotpocalypse though. I'm gonna leave it with a very safe warming up to a hot somewhere in there. And over on the runway, deny Cheddar and be doomed. She's giving homage to Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which she says is the reason she does drag. I'm sure the reason many a queen do drag. Generally speaking, the story of the musical is one that very much preaches self-love, duality, and more to meets the eye type of thing. And the look Cheddar is presenting is very true to the source material, but also very true to, I think, who Cheddar is. All of the rhinestones and bleaching on the denim jumpsuit are really cool details. And in general, I think this is a really great modernization of the original look done in a super draggy, made-for-TV way. This look is absolutely high. And next up, the Phil. So the character Phil gets in the musical is OG Mary. Basically the closest thing that we'd have to a true Mary Poppins in the Larry Poppins musical. And my interpretation of this character, having watched the musical back a couple different times, was they wanted whoever filled this role to really give two different performances, right? Because there's the very proper uptight delivery at first that I think LaPhil absolutely nailed. She's got great lines in there, like the plot line is atrocious, she's hitting the jokes, she is very in character. But then the character is challenged to be a little dirty. She starts saying bad words, the words that you don't like, but she's gonna say them anyways. But I didn't really see the transformation of the character happen on stage. But again, I think LaPhil did good. This is just me analyzing and overanalyzing, really looking at the critiques and the placements of everybody and trying to figure out what happened. Because she did very narrowly escape bottom two this episode. But she will very safely get a very safe hot here. But over on the runway, girl, another day, another slay. This look is absolutely gorgeous. She's giving homage to King and I. She's giving us Femme King realness and good God. The details of this are so immaculately placed on Phil's body. The jewelry, the rhinestones everywhere. The bodysuit that's painted to give that abs and pec illusion. And I think in this look, there is just the right amount of pieces and fabric fabric and everything that Phil can play with and have fun in the presentation on the runway, as we know Phil likes to do. And I think Phil knows just how gorgeous they're looking too. Long live King Phil. This look is hot. And next up, baby, baby, baby. This baby broke my heart this episode. In the challenge, baby was given the character of Martha Prude. And well, she's mother, she's rich, she refuses to live like the lower class, she's the parents of the two twins, and she really is responsible in this role for starting off the musical right, which I think she did. The critiques on Baby this episode had me scratching my head like I was last week, trying to really understand what they were even saying. They were telling her that she looked nervous and they lost her. But I would argue the exact opposite. She felt very present, confident, and I don't know how you lost someone who at the end of their role was literally screaming. But what do I know? I don't even watch the episodes. And since some people don't understand sarcasm, that was a joke. I actually do watch them and upload the best moments of my reactions to the episodes where I break everything down live with my patrons over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to exclusive videos, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. And make sure to hurry on over there so you can catch my new podcast, The Bus Stop. Anywho, we shan't waste too much time splitting halves. This performance was hot. And on the runway, Baby is giving us a look from And Juliet. And this is a relatively new New musical. Apparently it debuted in 2019, just three years ago. And from what I understand, the story is based on what if Juliet didn't die. And this was a significant musical to Baby because it was the first time that Juliet was played by a black woman on the West End stage. And Baby's look is very true to the source material. She did a great job of adapting it, but in the Baby style. We love a little blue jean Baby. And while this was a relatively
relatively simple look, sure, compared to some of the crazy theatrical productions that are sitting on this stage tonight. Danny Beard, I'm looking at you. She did a great job with it, and it's very baby. I love this look, and I think it's hot. And finally, Mrs. Beard herself. So in the challenge, as we mentioned earlier, she ends up with the role of Larry Poppins, but only because Pixie Polite decided that at the last minute, she didn't want LVD, so they swapped. I also loved that Danny was so confident in either role. Danny's response to the switch is just like, I'll give it a whack. The versatility, we love to see it. And in the musical, this character is the anti-Mary, who as it turns out is just a Beetlejuice parody, basically coming to wreak havoc on the lives of these two poor children. I loved how right before Larry Poppins is summoned on the back of the kite, you can see Larry Poppins, Larry Poppins, Larry Poppins three times. Pew. Her performance, I think, defines what a musical performance should be, but it also defines just like what a West End or, you know, Broadway musical performance should be. The caliber felt that good. And yes, it was hot, hot, hot. Plus, over on the runway, oh my god, what an amazing way to top yourself, or at least, you know, equally top in the same episode on the runway as you did in the challenge. Oh my god. She's giving Audrey two from Little Shop of Horrors. This is a phenomenal piece of theater, literally just on the stage. It is really, really crazy what she did here. I don't even know how that fit in the suitcases that they brought. And the crazier thing, it's not just a costume that she's wearing, it's like a mechanical working puppet that it's on her head. Everybody loves puppets. The tentacles move. The pot can go up and down depending on what she's doing with it. And the other girls are right. This look is going to make her straight. This is what gets everyone talking about Drag Race right here. Great job. Oh, I can't do thumbs up. I heard that Gen Z canceled the thumbs up emoji. Anywho, Piranha, I hardly know her. This look is hot. I also enjoyed that Danny knowing that this look was about to air on Twitter the day before tweeted out, are the silhouette police ready for tomorrow? Referring to critiques she's been seeing online, I suppose about her silhouette being similar for the past several runways. And yeah, to her credit, the Queens don't know which runway is going to go where, but this runway certainly came at the right time. And concerning this risical and episode as a whole, Wow. Tens, tens, tens across the board. I really enjoyed every aspect of it. There was gaggy drama, promoting mental health, amazing runways, an amazing challenge. This was top tier TV. So our win this episode, no big surprise, goes to Danny Beard. I do think if they really wanted to drive narrative a different way, they could have given the win to John Burst. Or maybe even Pixie or Peppa. Those were some of my favorite performances of the night. I also wasn't totally expecting Danny, because it's not often that they will give a queen to two wins two weeks in a row. That said, she absolutely earns her third repeater badge in this competition, making her the, statistically speaking, front runner of the competition. And in our bottom two, we have Dakota Schiffer and Baby. I 100% do understand the bottom placement for Dakota. However, again, Baby, they're kind of confused me. But I probably would have been kind of confused with anyone else, because I feel like at that same level in the musical, you do have Baby, LaFille, and Cheddar kind of in this good, but yes, there were just some queens that were better category tonight. So Baby and Dakota lip sync, and this really was one where I wouldn't have been surprised if Rue said double Shantae, because the critiques for everyone were so positive, and the lip sync from both of these girls was that good. If I absolutely had to pick, I would give it to Baby. But before Rue can say anything, she says, I have to say something and tells Rue that she needs to leave the competition. I would guess that some part of this plan on Baby's part was known to the producers. How much? I obviously don't know, but RuPaul typically does have a lot more objection when a queen is like, I wanna leave. Regardless of what happened behind the scenes though, I have so much respect for Baby for going through with this episode, absolutely killing it in the challenge and the lip sync and and overall being a ray of sunshine, I think, in this competition. The Buzzy Queen channel is over here sending her lots of love and best of luck in the world. And finally, let's take a look at what Sminty dropped on us in the <laughs> Digital Spy article. Concerning how the judges are weighing runways in Drag Race UK 4, she said this, Stop acting brand new. Don't tell us to do all these runways if you're not going to take any of them into consideration. You can give me my tens and say I look flawless, but when it comes to being in the bottom, it's like, trails off. Do I disagree that I should have been in the bottom? No. I think if I wasn't in the bottom, the fans were gonna go crazy and say that it literally would have been pitchforks with flames and torches. But 
but I think just keep the same energy through every season. If you're going to put people in the bottom because of their look, people's looks should save them from the bottom. I honestly think it could have been one of those things where it's like, Sminty Drop, this looks safe to you by the skin of your teeth, don't ever let this happen again. Which obviously is a really fair point, being told that you have like the best look on the runway that night, but then lip syncing in the bottom, I'm sure is a bit of a mind blowing experience. So those crazy runways that we see are not cheap. And if they're not counting, then why are the girls doing them? The answer there being, I think, well, because runways make good TV. They are mostly what people will remember, you know, five, 10 years from now, not necessarily how an individual queen performed in challenge. And I really don't think they have ever mattered on a regular season of RuPaul's Drag Race that Ru has judged. I think they mostly will just say something about a runway if they're getting critiques for a challenge. And it might sound like they're using a runway as justification to do a top or bottom placement, but we have seen many an amazing runway lip sync and go home. And now it's time for hottest hots. Danny Beard on the runway, Danny Beard in the challenge for me, and for my patrons as well. It was Danny Beard's episode, Girl She Swept. See you later, love ya, bye. Well, drag is dead, but I'm the funeral director. Hit it. Hi, ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rot. And oh my God, did mommy miss you. Today we'll be reviewing episode six of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. Our queens were challenged to make RuPaul laugh in Snatch Game. You know the drill. And the runway category was Tickled Pink. <laughs> and the Snatch Game episodes are ones that I always find interesting from a storytelling perspective. They're, I think, the most obvious in terms of what the producers want us to see. The number of responses a queen is shown giving to Rue during Snatch Game typically reflects their episodic placements, whether that's in the top or bottom. And rarely, if ever, is a fair Snatch Game actually shown on TV. But what you see isn't always the truth. So as we go through each queen today, we'll be looking at the number of responses they gave and how that reflects what happened in the episode. Episode. Get your calculators ready, set, go! First up, to go to Schiffer. I hardly? Okay, I'll stop. Now, Miss Dakota is a queen that truly surprised me tonight. I went into this episode thinking, hmm, I really wanna see some edge. I wanna see her push some boundaries. And I guess she read my mind from the past because she did Pete Burns for Snatch Game. Pete Burns was a music artist slash personality who sadly passed six years ago. You may have known Pete's song, Spin You Right Round, which was like back in the 80s. And unfortunately, I know that song not from living through the 80s, but from a particular website about meat that would spin. If you know, you know, and I hope for your sake you don't, but anyways, I was really pleasantly surprised with this Pete Burns from Dakota. She was shown giving three responses to Rue, all of which he laughed at. And my favorite was when she was going on about Michelle getting her brain replaced and then saying her Vogue routine made her sick to the point of nausea. And not only were all of her responses funny, but I think she had one of the more original performances in Snatch Game. These are the out of left field type of characters that I like to see done in Snatch Game well. And obviously I think she Pete burned up the Snatch Game stage. This was hot. And it's indeed a double feature for Miss Dakota tonight because on the runway, another, I was thinking of a sports phrase, slam dunk. I think she looks absolutely gorgeous. And I think this look is also very draggy. It's too much with that huge cape trailing behind her and also too little with that dress skirt line being, you know, placed real high up on those legs. This is the outfit you wear when you go to enter the hotel door room and you're wearing nothing but your nighty and you throw the duvet over your shoulders so you're more covered up. And I think it's hot. Next up, Black Peppa, who in Snatch Game tonight did Lil Nas X. And his ACL set, by the way, was phenomenal. Phenomenal. If you have a chance, go see him live. Oh my God. The outfits, the performance, the drag of it all. I was living. As a Snatch Game character though, I was dying. My take on Lil Nas is his humor feels very nuanced. When he's making jokes online, and he often does, you kind of have to know the joke on the joke on the joke. It's like deep internet culture stuff a lot of times, or just like so stupid that there's no point at all. And generally speaking, I think that type of humor is hard to sell maybe to an in-person audience and probably even harder to sell to somebody like RuPaul. She was shown giving three responses to Ru, none of which he laughed at, and all of which were confusing. For example, Rue asks her, what does the X in Lil Nas X stand for? And she says, X stands for how many chromosomes are there? Rue says, how many do you have? And then Peppa says, I have as many as you want, daddy. <laughs>
This was one of those Snatch Game performances to me that I was laughing at watching because it was so awkward and as Peppa has put out on the interwebs, cringy. The other one that was absolutely sending me was, she says, I went to the club the first time and they gave me water. It was amazing. I don't know what she was saying or why. I think the bigger problem though was not Peppa's choice of character, but rather Peppa's real problem was her inner saboteur working against her before Snatch Game even started. She's in the workroom talking about how she doesn't think she's funny and doesn't feel confident about the challenge. This performance was iconic in its own right, but it was not a number one hit, so I'm gonna give it a and over on the runway, our queen of headpieces once again reigns mightily. And my first thought about this look was, it certainly is interesting, but I wasn't quite sure what it was until I was able to get a closer inspection on everything. In fact, because of the runway lights, the softer pink tones in the hat and the pants weren't even reading as pink. And the jacket being red and white checks didn't really help with the delivery of the pink theme either. We do see though, as she gets closer to the panel, her head is made out of what is meant to be cotton candy that she's eating. And I'm gathering the jacket was supposed to be some kind of candy wrapper. And the other thing I was confused about was in her confessional, she is explaining that the runway is Marge Simpson, but make it pink? I was like, I don't know what's happening. But once we got to the end of it all, I really did appreciate the look because I think it's a really interesting silhouette. The fashion of it is visually entertaining. And overall, the reveal of having candy in the hat was super fun. And I'm going to give this sweet treat a hat. <laughs> Next up, this is your sign to clean your room, you filthy animals. It's LaFil as Marie Kondo. And this was a really interesting pick, I think, from Phil. I had heard the whole, you know, does this spark joy and if not get rid of it thing going around like a year or two ago, but I never actually looked up who the person saying that was. And she is, according to her business's website, a Japanese organizing consultant, author, and TV presenter. She's written four books on organizing, which have collectively sold millions of copies around the world. And she even has a series on Netflix and some digital exclusives like this one with Hassan Minaj, where she goes through some of his stuff in his life, asking if it sparks joy or not. Yeah, it makes me really happy. <laughs> you notice in this clip, she's speaking Japanese, which means they're communicating through a translator, which also gave me some context for why LaFil was making the jokes that they were making. All of which, by the way, relied on some sort of word mistranslation, listening to the translator in her ear, or misspelling words. We saw three responses from Phil, and RuPaul laughed at none of them. There was that very awkward response that RuPaul just kind of does where he's like, mm-hmm. Okay. And as the judges mentioned during their critiquing session, there were probably a million different directions Phil could have taken this character. Make her filthy, make her a raging bee. But ultimately there was no depth beyond miscommunicating or mistranslating words. I was watching like, girl, the joke's not landing. Let's do a different one. And she kept doing the same thing. For me, this performance did not spark joy. It was a and you know, upon reflection of this episode, I was thinking how strange it was that her Snatch Game character was so one dimensional while her outfit on the runway was literally everything but the kitchen sink. She is literally wearing a giant pink tent as a gown, complete with an umbrella on her head because why the hell not? And the utility doesn't end there because underneath the tent, she's got bags and bags and bags and God knows what else. This outfit is perfect for when you've got the Girl Scouts meeting at seven and the Met Gala at nine. In fact, I'm telling my kids that this was the 2019 Met Gala. With a looking camp straight in the eye. I know I'm being really silly about this look because it is so silly. It's very whimsical, fresh, and interesting all around. Words that I think, having seen LaFille on a few episodes of Drag Race, very well describe them. The drag and drama of it all. I love this look and I'm gonna give it a <laughs> Next up, Pixie Polite. Who did Dame Shirley Bassey for Snatch Game? And when RuPaul was walking through the workroom, RuPaul did give Pixie a little cautionary warning about doing this character. You know, with Pixie not being the same skin color of Shirley Bassey and all. And they end up having a productive conversation about how Pixie wants to focus on the mannerisms of Shirley and nothing more. Unfortunately, though, Pixie's bold choice had a really weak payoff. She was shown giving three responses, two of which RuPaul kind of laughed at. She would start off funny in both of these instances and then kind of trail off into nothing. It was like she saw the song title Diamonds Are Forever by Shirley Bassey and then decided that was her entire personality, I guess. I think the issue she was facing was a nervousness to volley with Ru because he'll do that during Snatch Game. He's kind of testing the queens and putting feelers out to see who can handle what type of questions. And every time Rue went back for more, Pixie just kind of crumbled. And while diamonds may be forever, this performance was a 
But over on the runway, she's got a bit of a redemption this episode. Her tickled pink look is an homage to Rue's iconic original drag race pink jumpsuit. It fits well, she's got a great silhouette, the helmet with the hair coming out of it is very cute, and the flag reveal was campy and fun. I'd certainly throw it on for a few laps around the track in my race car. I think though the look kind of lacked impact with the judges because everyone seemed to have a different frame of reference for what she was doing. Alan Carr said she reminded him of Cheryl Hull, and the guest judge Mel B says Baby Spice wore something similar. I thought she kind of looked like the pink Power Ranger. And all those things can be good for relatability, but it does have that, I've seen this before, give me something new type of reaction. Again though, I like the look. It just maybe needed an oil change or some fresh tires, you know, something to make it more original. I'll give this look a very safe hi. Next up. <laughs> ah, that was my impersonation of Danny Beard impersonating Syl Black. Thank you. Which I hope emphasizes pretty much nothing of what Danny Beard said could be understood. That said, I didn't totally hate it. I'm gathering there is some sort of joke I'm missing though. I've looked at some performance videos from her and I don't really get the quality that she's speaking like that. She's from what I can tell a very nice lady who was a singer and television presenter in England. It was kind of lukewarm for me. We saw four responses from her, one of which was an ad lib into Black Peppa's response and Rue laughed at two of them. This was just though another one dimensional character from our Snatch Game panel tonight. And this coming from Danny really surprised me because Danny absolutely nailed the improv challenge and the musical and like pretty much everything they've done. To be specific bad at improv while impersonating somebody else seems out of character. Ha, for Danny. So yeah, this was a rot. On the runway though, Danny's giving us pink popsicle dream ice cream perfection. And this look is more of what we have grown to love from Danny on the runway. Clean, sophisticated silhouettes giving fashion, giving gender bending, and overall fresh concepts, I would say. Is the silhouette similar to a lot of her earlier runways this season? Yes, but I think it is different enough that it definitely breathes on its own. And I really loved the details of like the pink mustache and the whimsical feathers on the sleeves of the arm. She, I think, leaned really well into tickled pink. She owns 51% of this soft serve company. This look is hot. Next up. John Burr's blonde, who in Snatch Game wanted to do Enya. RuPaul kind of gets her off of that idea and on to St. Patty, St. Patrick, but all dragged up. He was very obviously just playing into the stereotype of you're Irish, do something Irish. Really though, it's a good suggestion from Ru. He's using his producer hat to look for the common denominator, something that is easily sellable to a large audience who's watching the show and that also he probably personally will think is funny. But I am that same chair would do literally whatever the hell RuPaul told me to do. If she says to do something for a snatch game, you do it. And if you don't, you pay the price. We have seen queens pay the price. UK season three. So John Burr's tests the luck of the Irish and it turns out she's quite lucky. The character she brings to snatch game, though while I guess completely fictional, St. Patty, was a lot of fun. John Burr's is really made to do something like snatch game or the improv thing or the rusical. I mean like, there's a lot of stage ready personality in this queen. That is a professional. All three of the responses that John Burrs gave were laughed at by Rue. And in another snatch game, she maybe could have won. She not only played ball, but I think hit a home run. This was hot. On the runway though, tickled pink. She certainly hit the brief. We're getting the pink feathers tickling her. I suppose. But the weird thing about this look was she comes out kind of looking like a pink toilet paper roll or like Jasmine Masters in her butterfly thing coming down the runway. And I was like waiting for the reveal for so long. I'm like, girl, what is this? And then to have it finally revealed to like a sweet 16 kind of homecoming prom dress thing was a little bit of a letdown, I'll admit. Although for the amount of time she made us wait for that reveal, I would have been a little disappointed with anything less than a pot of gold. She looks gorgeous, yes. I just was not too excited by the look personally. So because of that, I am going to give this look a rot. Next up, grab a slice. It's Cheddar Gorgeous. Dr. Cheddar Gorgeous, if you're nasty. And it's Natch Game. Cheddar does Queen Elizabeth the First, who, as a reminder, is one of the many members of the various royal families we have seen over the years appear in Snatch Game. Rosé did Mary Queen of Scots on season 13. Anita Wiglet did Queen Elizabeth II on her Snatch Game, Down Under One, which got her a win. And heavy is the crown, but Cheddar Gorgeous wears it well. This was a 
phenomenal performance from Cheddar. It was extremely theatrical. And, you know, take a character that everybody loves and make them skanky. She did that. What really put the nail in the coffin, though, in this performance was that crazy, like, Pennywise evil clown laugh that she would do after every response. If you didn't laugh at the actual thing she wrote on the card, you were laughing at that. All four of the responses that she was shown giving to RuPaul in Snatch Game were laughed at and received well. She really was the main character of Snatch Game in this season. She's got a brain and she's not afraid to use it. This performance was hot. And now we jump into her runway, which is not only a great piece of living art, but an homage to queer history. She's wearing a black kind of netted bodysuit and there's a pink triangle everywhere you look. And there are straps going around her body that say silence equals death. And she talks about how this look is reclaiming the pink triangle in a way that the act up group did back in the 80s during the HIV crisis. The pink triangle has been reappropriated from a symbol of oppression to a symbol of queer resistance. And during the episode, we also hear Cheddar talk about the destigmatization of HIV, the invention of PrEP, a wonderful pill that you can take to help prevent the virus, and reminds everyone that undetectable is untransmittable. And this look is so important to see on TV, especially, I think, for the younger generation, because there is not a lot of great public public education about the virus or its history or even the queer culture's relation to it in the 80s. Cheddar is literally educating the children, pushing boundaries, and Cheddar has wrapped all of this up in a signature, identifiably Cheddar gorgeous package. Obviously this look I think is hot. And looking back at this Snatch Game overall, my initial thoughts when watching it were this seems short. Normally during Snatch Game, we see confessionals edited in to help drive the narrative of who's doing well or not well. And we usually see a lot more interactions between the contestants on the panel. There was literally one shown when Danny Beard added something into what Peppa said. In fact, there were only 23 responses shown at all during this Snatch Game, an average of 3.28 per person. Well, for comparison, the easy data I had on hand was from Canada's Drag Race Season 3, where they had eight contestants and we were shown a total of 32 responses, including confessionals. That averages about four responses per queen. More interestingly though, this was I think the most evenly distributed in terms of responses Snatch Game I have ever seen. Every contestant was shown with either three or four responses. In the Canada 3 example I was just using, there would be queens with like two shown responses who were basically completely overlooked and forgotten about during Snatch Game and then queens with like five responses who would be in the top or bottom. And that's pretty standard fare for Snatch Game. There is a heavy-handed edit in every single one of them I've ever seen, except this one. And really, looking back at this season as a whole, I will say it has felt pretty fairly judged. There has not been a ton of like, whoa, wait, what just happened moments, which basically was every episode of season three. So maybe the producers took some notes there and said, we need to chill out with all that. Or maybe they just found themselves in a situation where it simply made the most sense to include an even number of responses because that was the best way they could fill the time. I think it's also worth noting here, this episode was very dominated by Cheddar Gorgeous and the challenge and runway. It felt very much like a defining moment for her, as did last episode for Danny Beard. That is to say, I think they're starting to story tell to us who the top four is going to be. Anywho, Cheddar Gorgeous gets the win this week, and uh, yeah, I very much agree with that. In the bottom two are La Phil and Black Peppa, which was very sad to me, but I also agreed with this bottom two. At least from what we saw in the edit, right? That lip sync though, girl, that was wild. I did react to it over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to exclusive videos, and access to the Bussy Queen Discord server. And you can join by clicking the link in the description of this video. <gasps> See you there. But as I mentioned earlier, LaPhil had everything in this dress, but the kitchen sink, maybe not. She probably did. She was pulling out fabric. She was taking her shoes off and dumping leaves on the stage. She was like laying in a pile of her outfit and things. I was like, girl, too much. It's too much. It's too much. Also, I don't really want to see like a bare foot. If she had taken the shoes off and had another pair of shoes underneath, that's the reveal we need. So I did agree with the elimination choice and Black Peppa survives the bottom two. As for my hottest hots this week, obviously Cheddar Gorgeous gets the challenge and runway for me, but I really want to give an extra round of applause to Dakota Schiffer for her Snatch Game. I thought it was great. I also asked my patrons and they agree with me on the challenge and runway. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye.
Oh, hey, hold on just a second. My Rue earpiece is ringing. Hello, Rue? You want me to host season 16? Well, you know I don't host, but I'll try anything once. Hi, Ugly. It's me, Pussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode seven of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four. And today, Rue's gone missing. <gasps> AKA, she was probably just filming another spinoff for the franchise. But in her absence, we have Michelle as main judge and Raven as guest judge. And today our queens were challenged to give a strong drag family resemblance makeover to the queen team, who we learn are the behind the scenes motherly forces keeping our queens fed on time and generally healthy during the long filming days of Drag Race. And it was a beautiful episode, sure, but dare I say there there's been a robbery or two. <laughs> so we'll be breaking down each queen's makeover as I saw it. And then at the end of today's video, we'll be taking a look at some allegations that are now floating around online from Kimora Amore about a future Canada versus the world cast member. Now bring out the clones. First up, it's Jomber's Blonde and Nano Noir. So this makeover, I think of the entire cast, left the most to be desired for me in terms of actual transformation. I wasn't really getting drag bands family so much as even the judges pointed out, I was getting friends hanging out who kind of like to dress similarly because the two did match very well. Yes, and Jombers and Olivia, Nanu's outfit, were really pretty stylistically speaking, but there was nothing really here that screamed Jombers other than it's a cute fashionable look, which I think really was the problem Jombers was facing in this challenge. Jombers' biggest standout moments in the competition thus far have been in the Rusical and Snatch game. She's got a huge huge personality, but hasn't really channeled that into a specific aesthetic yet that is easily capturable, I think, in a challenge like this. And even more confusing, I think, was the shtick of her and her partner doing this mime clown kind of fantasy on the runway. The performance of what they did was very fun, but again, was like, why are they doing this? And how does it relate back to John Burr's? And if we are going to go with this clown thing, like, give me the full fantasy. Give me full drag, not just two pretty ladies hanging out on the runway together doing a mime show. And this challenge, I will say, has to be one of the toughest for the queens because they're trying to sell to the judges and an audience what they think they have imparted their drag is onto the audience. Which is to say, we've only seen these queens for six weeks and we don't have the full idea of who they truly are. So our interpretations of what their drag is may not necessarily be the full picture of who they are as a queen. In essence, this is a branding challenge, and I'm not sure what brand John Burrs was really selling here or why. So I'm going to give her makeover a even if their outfits were pretty cute. Next up, Pixie Polite and Trixie True Love. So Pixie is paired with Wendy, who we learn is a day one queen team care member. And girl has missed Wendy's scene and unfortunately had to adjust it all. Even a bollock, that poor, poor woman. I'm sure she does not get paid enough. And these two have quite the interesting visual presentation on the runway. But before I break down what they're actually wearing, I want to compliment the message of what Pixie was imparting with these outfits. She tells us these looks are inspired by her time spent in childhood in her nan's garden. It was the one place, she says, where she felt like she could truly be herself. And so now here Pixie is as an adult living that childhood fantasy and they're dressed as fairies. The actual silhouettes of what they're wearing are even kind of Tinkerbell-esque. And I think the idea and concept of what Pixie did to herself and Trixie was absolutely sold on the runway. I understood the perspective of where she approached this makeover from. However, it was in the execution that I think she really struggled. She herself looks pretty good. The outfit fits her, her makeup and hair look amazing, but when you pan over to Wendy, Trixie True Love, you see that Pixie has kind of just taken what would have fit her in terms of the makeup and the outfit and just slapped them on to Trixie True Love instead of adjusting for this other person's face contours and body proportions. The dress kind of swallows Trixie True Love whole and the makeup doesn't do enough to complement Wendy's actual face. Even she comments that she felt older in drag than she expected. To. So it was unfortunate that that was the overall effect of what Pixie accomplished. The branding Pixie nailed, but the actual makeover part, she failed. This was a 
And next up, we've got Black Sapa and her partner, Floor, who she transforms into Chili Peppa. We love a well-rounded spice cabinet. These two come out in some very structured little black dresses that are honestly really great artistic silhouettes. And while some queens approached this challenge from like a matrilineal perspective tonight, Black Peppa went for the twins perspective, twinning, and has completed that fantasy out with ponytails that even like hook up at the end points. It was taking me back to the season three drag queens and space challenge when they were like, we are on the lookout for single guys. And the actual makeup and transformation of what Black Peppa did tonight, I think was top tier. The club kid kind of clown makeup was really cool. The ponytails, an excellent touch. And overall, these two were 100% giving me drag family resemblance. When to become one, when to become one. That said, whose drag family are we talking about here? I'm not sure it was Black Peppa's so much as it was Danny Beard's. And Danny even shades Black Peppa in the workroom for doing the white face, which Danny has kind of made a trademark on the show. And no, of course she doesn't own it, but I very much could see this exact silhouette and face paint on Danny. Which is to say, was this what I expected Peppa to pull out of her spice cabinet for this makeover challenge? Not necessarily. When I think of Peppa's drag, I think of headpieces, reveals, high fashion, and surprises, and this definitely fits the surprise category, but did it fit the others? I'm not so sure. I also think it was a fair critique to hear from the judges that they wanted to see more from the neck down because it was a very head and hair focused look. I certainly wasn't underwhelmed by these looks, but I also wasn't overwhelmed. Maybe just like a nice, safe, hot, <laughs> whelmed. That said, I do think it was the success in makeup execution that I think for me at least, definitely allowed this look to stand above, like for example, John who also went for a clown type of fantasy. Next up, grab a slice or two tonight with Cheddar and Brie Gorgeous. So Cheddar of the cast members, I think has the easiest time in her makeover transformation. Gemma, who becomes Brie, confesses that she does drag every single day because you are born naked and the rest is drag after all. That is to say, she's already feeling her fantasy before the makeover even starts and I lived for her. But it did kind of put Cheddar, I think one notch above the rest in terms of fairness today. That said, Cheddar does not take it easy in this transformation, even though she could have. She turned Gemma into a full clone copy sister daughter alien spawn twin from the alien deity galaxies far above and beyond and away. They both got these beautiful double victory hair rolls. Breeze is blue and Cheddar's is this reddish auburn autumnal color. And I love that their looks overall are so similar yet contrast in really beautiful ways with those blue and red colors. Cheddar succeeded in all of the ways that you really want want to see a queen succeed in a makeover challenge. The execution of the outfits is beautiful. They are unmistakably styled, like Cheddar would style something. The makeup, very Cheddar. And overall, you feel 100% transported to the world of gorgeous when you see these looks on the runway together. Cheddar gave birth on the runway, and Papa don't preach because she is keeping the baby. This makeover was hot. Next up, did somebody say dolls? Valley of the dolls. It's Dakota and Brigitte Schiffer. So Dakota is paired with queen team member Lucy, another day Winner. And they are such a cute little pairing who you can tell through the camera have such a beautiful chemistry together. Unfortunately though, the makeover experiment from Team Schiffer was not well received by the judges. However, I disagree totally. The actual transformation of Lucy into Brigitte, I thought was beautiful. And the two absolutely gave drag family resemblance and more importantly, they gave Schiffer drag family resemblance. These two were 100% giving that 60s little doll fantasy that Dakota saw on the runway every single week. She said, branding? Yes, ma'am, I've been giving you branded. I've been giving you 60s Valley of the Dolls and I'm gonna give it to you here again in the makeover challenge. Dakota, I think accomplished drag family resemblance a hell of a lot more than many of the other queens tonight. I was so confused at their placement of her in the bottom. The judges seemed so heavily focused on not liking the actual outfits that Dakota was presenting as this pair. And Michelle, of course, gave the classic, you're giving the same silhouette type of critique to Dakota to sell the reason of why she should be in the bottom. It was all just giving very forced storyline and did not understand. To go to the bottom for this, I could not believe it. This makeover was high. 
Right. And finally, Danny Beard and Mizzy Mustache. So Danny is paired with Miss Mystique, who we learn has a bit of hesitation in her pairing with Danny because she finds out that she may have to wear some facial hair on the runway. And this, for her, is an idea that's making her uncomfortable at first because she's somebody who has been mistaken for a male person, she says in her life, and that hasn't set well with her. And Danny hears all of this and approaches Mystique with open arms, an open heart, and really, I think, did an excellent job of welcoming her into the Danny Beard family. Like, Danny did an excellent job of the transformation of Mystique into Mizzy, and this pairing was really fun to watch on the runway. The makeup hair and outfits these two were wearing were beautiful compliments to each other, and you know in a makeover challenge when someone is having that much fun that the makeover was a success. Plus, I think Danny absolutely nailed the branding aspect of this challenge. These looks were unmistakably of the Danny Beard catalog, and because the final looks were so gender effy, I think they were a great representation of what drag can allow someone to feel. And these two, I think of any other pair, had one of the most beautiful storylines. You got to see how the power of drag allowed someone to overcome a deeply held fear. Plus, I mean, how can you not love the drag name Mizzy Mustache? Iconic. I did think it was kind of funny though that Danny emphasized the facial hair in these looks so much, despite this really only being, what, the second time that we've seen Danny actually emphasize facial hair on the runway? I think last week with the pink mustache was really the first. Every other time she's pretty much just painted over it in white. Regardless though, I had so much fun with these looks and I think the makeover was absolutely hot. Which is to say obviously my hottest hot tonight goes to Danny Beard and Mizzy Mustache. I did also ask my patrons though to vote on their hottest hot tonight and they voted for Cheddar and Brie Gorgeous. So the win tonight goes to Cheddar Gorgeous and this did surprise me a little bit because I thought the storyline that Danny and Mizzy had was really compelling and Cheddar's makeover just felt a little too effortless for me. I was like, oh, I like to see somebody have a challenge or obstacle and overcome it and Cheddar was just like, no obstacle, no problem, I'm still gonna kill it. That said, I do think the win was well deserved. That was another makeover that absolutely blew me away. The bottom two tonight were what really got me, gal. Dakota in the bottom two, I could not believe it. And y'all already heard my reasonings, but I think it should have been Pixie and John Burrs. The idea that Dakota would be in the bottom at all, much less going home later because she was giving a branded silhouette that she had very much trademarked as her own in a makeover challenge? Make it make sense. It was just like, oh, okay, this is when y'all wanted Dakota to go home, so you just made some shit up and threw her in the bottom. Whatever. And the lip sync between Dakota and Pixie goes exactly how you expect it to go when one of the queens is there for a third time in this competition. I did react to this lip sync and the other best parts of this episodes though in my new Patreon exclusive podcast called The Bus Stop and you can go listen to that and see my reaction over on patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to that exclusive content, access to the Bussy Queen Discord server, and more. And you can join by clicking the link in the description of this video. See you there. But Dakota goes home, which I agree, Pixie probably had the better lip sync here. I just don't think Dakota should have been there at all. Now, on to the drama. So Kimura Amor was seen on Twitter earlier this week saying this. I love that people are calling out others, dot, dot, dot. Since we are on the topic of blackface, I think it's time we are open and honest about a Canada's Drag Race queen allegedly doing a form of blackface and everyone just keeping quiet. Thursday, anyone? This quote tweet, by the way, was retweeting someone else who had retweeted a video of two seeming to be teenagers doing blackface in some sort of public place. It might be a Walmart. I'm not really sure sure, where they wrote, meanwhile, in Utah. And I have censored these people actually doing blackface here for sensitivity purposes, but it had been going viral online in spaces like TikTok and Twitter. And to that tweet, a person on Twitter responded to Kimora writing, how about you say their name instead of stirring the pot? And Kimora said, oh, I will, but I've learned that conversations are better than posts. And sure enough, Kimora followed through that following Thursday in a Twitter live space where she's heard talking along with Isis Couture about the person who allegedly did this form of blackface. This is what they say. Play with these nice people. It's Rita Baga. Come on. Can I <laughs> know that Rita? Yes. Like, I, I said, this is someone I respect. It's not, this is not shade. This is not to bring down anyone. There apparently, allegedly, OCN said to all of us that this, she was performing, I think it was a Glee theme, and she was Amber Riley. What do you mean, allegedly, girl? OCN's payment went to Rita. What do you mean, allegedly? I'm saying allegedly because we have to say allegedly, I says we got to say allegedly. So, yeah. allegedly. 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 OCN got the yeah. garment, the look from Miss Baga, Miss Rutabaga, because sis 
had the garment because she was performing as Amber Riley. Is that what I heard? Like, this, this, this isn't about cancellation. I need to know that this wasn't done and that this isn't something that's just okay. You can't just wear our skin and be okay and, and, and think that we're going to be okay and, and put some braids on. Like, And I want to highlight she was using the words alleged and allegedly here when discussing the person who allegedly did a form of blackface. Playing with these nice people. It's Rita Vega. And she is also re sharing this story from the perspective of another queen, Ocean Aqua Black. Which is just to say, alleged information is just that, alleged information. And I expect due to the gravity of this alleged information, there will be more developments to follow, so I will be tracking this closely here on my channel. But I'd love to know what all of y'all are thinking about this, as well as the outcome of this episode of Drag Race UK. So let me know down in the comments below. See y'all later, love ya, bye! Oh, you know, they need YouTubers like me, so if they can get on their keyboards and make me the best Bad guy, Bussy Queen. Hi, Ugly. It's me, and welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today we'll be reviewing episode 8 of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season 4. Our queens were challenged to act in an inward mystery. Question mark? I mean it was definitely the squirrel with the laser eyes in the makeup room, right? But joke aside, it was a Big Brother meets Squid Game parody. But side note, Drag Race franchise, please, I am begging of you. Please make a Big Brother spinoff and feature the cast members from seasons past. It would be so amazing. The drag, the drama, I'll host. And the runway category was rough and red. A celebration of ruffles. Whee! So we'll be breaking all of that down and then at the end of today's video going over some dragon drama. We've got Dakota Shipper's thoughts on her exit, why she wore that jumper, and we'll be looking at the Drag Race UK franchise apology that was issued earlier this week on all their social media platforms after they mixed up two of their queens. Now let's play red light, green light. First up and in the order they appeared on the runway tonight, Danny Beard. And oh my god did she look absolutely stunning on the runway. She's in this gorgeous satin silk ruffled garment that is kind of giving potted plants, almost like the fashion house version of her piranha plant little shop of horrors look from a few weeks ago. And this look is gorgeous for many reasons. The beautiful color, the silhouette created by the stacks of ruffles on her waist and in her hat and around her neck, and the contrast of all these wavy ruffles with that harder, familiar Danny Beard silhouette with that bone corsetry going down the sides of it. It's a gorgeous gown, and when a queen is feeling her oats like this, it is even more gorgeous. This look is and in the acting challenge, she's assigned the character Divina Decal, a play on the British Big Brother host and presenter Davina McCall, who is described in this script as gossipy, glamorous, and gooped. Relatable. So I'll admit I'm not the most familiar with Big Brother, especially the British spin-off, but I did watch some clips to get a better understanding of Miss Davina and to kind of see the mannerisms that Danny was capturing, and I think she did a really great job, at least based on the limited knowledge I have of her, right? To me, it felt like what she did was done not only with respect, but with a great wink wink nudge nudge, and she also added her own layers to this character. It wasn't just an impersonation. She was acting! Huh. Danny actually did super well in this challenge. I watched it and thought, wow, what a masterclass in acting, and I was kind of shocked she didn't ultimately get the win. This was hot. Next up, and looking bewitching, might I say tonight, it's Jumpers Blonde! Or just Jay, if you're Rue. And this look from Jumpers tonight, oh my gay god. It is so delectably gorgeous. Head to toe. She is not only giving fashion, but this really interestingly unique perspective on a look like this. It feels feels a little French, a little royal, a little whimsical, like Peter Pan or something. It's just stunning. She's captured ruffles in the side bustle of the skirt train and in the shoulder piece. She said on Instagram this look was inspired by portraits of stately homes that she would visit when she was a kid. And Rue was right, this is one of the most beautiful looks I think I've ever seen walk down the RuPaul's Drag Race runway. I would say it's kind of more difficult to make a look that is PC like this be so glamorous and gorgeous, but Jombers has 100% not only accomplished that, but more. Paint me like one of your British girls. This look is hot. And in the challenge, it's a bird, it's a dog, it's a girl and a dog. Drummer's character in this skit is sassy and fugly the dog. Or is it Pugsley? The jury's still out on that, but she heard me right. She is playing two characters in one. It was a really, really strange decision, I think, on the part of the producers slash writers that put this 
sketch together. And this girl and dog combo could have, I suppose, been some reference that went over my head, but I just was really stuck in trying to figure out why the hell she <laughs> was a girl and a dog at the same time. It was just too many layers in a drag race acting challenge, in my mediocre opinion. But as for how Jombers actually did in the role, I think she did okay. Like, I don't think she did a bad job. It was just an unmemorable performance that left me scratching my head. And it wasn't the fleas. And no, it wasn't my lice. Oh. She had her moments, but ultimately, Jombers failed to take this character beyond Fussy Queen. Send Pugsley Fugsley back to the pounds. This was a soft rat. Next up, grab a slice. It's Cheddar Gorgeous, who's finally, apparently, starting to feel competitive in the competition on episode 8 with her fourth win. <laughs> just goes to show, I suppose, how easily she is just brie, brie, like the, the cheese laugh, zing through the competition. And this week we got a little more personal with Cheddar and several of the other queens as they share stories about their dads. In fact, Cheddar, Danny, Jombers, and Pixie all shared dad stories. Love dads. <sighs> <sighs> Too bad mine's dead. First, let's talk about her runway. She is giving an homage to the Pansy Project. And this was something that I learned of. We love learning. Thank you for teaching the children, Cheddar Gorgeous. From their website, thepansyproject.com slash about. Linked in the description of this video. Thank God. Their site reads, Paul Hartfleet plants pansies at the site of homophobic abuse. He finds the nearest source of soil to where the incident occurred and generally, without civic permission, plants one unmarked pansy. The flower is then documented in its location the image is entitled after the abuse. They then, as an example, list off slurs that homosexual people might be called in the streets and elaborate that the pansies are a visual representation of these bad things happening. Bad things that often go unreported to police and authority figures. Things that, if you know, you know, as part of the queer umbrella, just kind of happen day to day. And if you want to know more about the Pansy Project, I've linked them in the description of this video. It's a really beautiful project with a really beautiful message. But not only is Cheddar's look tonight a great homage to a wonderful social good, but also a beautiful piece of stunning alien deity fashion. She's taken the concept of ruffles and abstracted it to flower petals ruffling in the pattern of a pansy flower. I love how simple, dangerous, spooky, scary, but also fashionable and intriguing this look is. It makes you ask questions. That's good drag. And I also love this thing that she's done last runway and this one where she has put an accessory in her mouth for symbolic reasons, but also fashion reasons that I think really add a lot to the look. It's not something I think we've seen on Drag Race really done or branded by any particular queen in the past. Cheddar has once again presented a look that balances high concept drag and important queer history teaching slash acknowledgement. And this look is absolutely hot. And she in the acting challenge today is the character of Minxie, model, business mogul, influencer, a sort of Kardashian or Paris Hilton type, essentially. And Cheddar did get to choose roles this week, which made me at first think that her choice of this role was kind of simple, because a lot of this character's development is already done for the audience. We all understand and know the influencer type. You are here after all. But in that same ease of recognizability in a character like this, you also get cliche or run the risk of your performance being generic. And so I was sitting there a little nervous for Cheddar thinking, hmm, this could be a trap. But the extra layers that she added to this performance allowed her to take what would have been an otherwise fairly basic role into something much more interesting. She had great wink wink nudge nudge acting, which I think was really important in a parody challenge like this. And I think her timing and delivery of lines was perfect. Cheddar was yet again this week in a league of her own. And I'm gonna give this performance a hot melty pot of cheese. Next up, RuPaul's apparently been following her for years. Watch out, Pixie. Ooh. So, Pixie Polite's runway look tonight for the ruffle category. I would say meets the brief. There are ruffles, but it does feel a little lackluster. I think especially coming last in this runway segment, the first four were total knockout home run looks and Pixies left a little to be desired in my and the judge's opinion tonight. Focusing on the positives first, I mean, waist up, she looked absolutely gorgeous. Her hair, her makeup, stunning every single week. And I also think she had a really interesting approach to this runway concept of ruffles, going the Elizabethan route and tapping into some of that Tudor fashion. It's like all the pieces are there for this look, it's just the final effect was not as impactful as maybe she had hoped it would be. So this is like a waist up hot, waist down rot. A warming up will set. In the squirrel game, she's playing the character of Kimmy Booburn, another character tonight intended to be a parody of a real life person, Kim Woodburn. I think she's most famous from her series, How Clean Is Your House, and also did do Big Brother. And the clips from that girl, 
they are wild. That is some reality TV drama. Don't you ever talk to me like that. No. Don't you oh, mean me, fat slob. Fat slob. Don't you mean oh. me, because I'm a bit of cleaner. <laughs> this lady is quotable, quotable, quotable house down boots. Which is to point out that Pixie had a lot of source material to work with here in this performance, and she did a great impersonation of this crazy character. But I wasn't finding myself laughing at Pixie in the same way that I would laugh at Cheddar or Danny when they were on the screen. It was almost like Pixie was doing a character study more than a parody. It felt so serious and stiff at times, even if she was doing a damn good job at acting the character. She showed us that she knew her way around a broom and mop, but not necessarily around the house of Big Mother. I would still give this a very safe hot though. And I do want to point out here, they did end up giving out this like one note critique to several of the queens tonight, Pixie included, and they kept talking about looking for peaks and valleys. And I can't help but ask, did Michelle do the best job directing? Because during rehearsal, she seemed a little out of it, miffed, upset with the proceedings of what was going on and I don't know if it was like played up for TV that there was lots of line missing and forgetting things or if that was really happening and that's why she actually was mad but usually I feel like we see Michelle step in a lot more and offer help when it's clearly needed. I'll talk a little bit more about the writing of this though at the end of the video. And finally our season of the season, Black Peppa and oh my god, she said it best. You know she gives it to us every time on the runway. Every single time she is slaying that runway. Her looks have a very clear point of view and consistent branding that I think is really necessary to stand out on Drag Race as above the rest of the pack. She's giving us a sequence do-rag face kini combo. Contrasted with ruffled denim for this overall club kid meets clown meets visually interesting piece of art on the runway. This is so much fun. I also love that she made sure we could see her face was beat behind the face caney. The dynamic force of Black Peppa gave us whimsicality and severe fashion. This look is hot. And I'm not joking, bitch. But in the acting challenge, Peppa failed to find that whimsicality she so effortlessly brings to her runways. Her character was Bev Growls, the ultimate TV survivalist, who was yet another real life person parody, I think supposed to be of Bear Grylls, who did the television series Man vs. Wild, which, you know, kind of makes sense with the costuming that Black Peppa was wearing as well. And honestly, looking at the lines that she delivered and how this character was written, I don't know what the hell she was supposed to do with this character. It was like, scream and be a little bit goofy, eh, but not too screamy or too goofy, just a little bit. But why just a little bit? And I feel like the more background characters like this that have less lines in Drag Race acting challenges traditionally have more of a sight gag type of thing going on. I'm thinking of like when they do the baby at the country food dinner table, or when they had just Vivacious's head under the dinner plate. And because I feel like there wasn't a lot there, Black Peppa's character didn't stand out, but I don't think it was for a lack of trying. It smells a little like sabotage to me. But yeah, the performance was Right. And my overall thoughts on this acting challenge specifically, well, I did think it was kind of lackluster. I reacted to it over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash bussyqueen. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to reaction videos, and access to the Bussy Queen Discord server and you can join by clicking the link in the description of my video. See you there. I think this acting challenge had good bones, but the writers didn't really progress the plot anywhere. It felt like just a bunch of random scenes cut together with no cohesive storyline. And sure, I do suppose that is kind of what watching Big Brother is like sometimes. You're waiting for drama to happen or a challenge to happen, what have you. But I just think there needed to be a little more glue between these disparate pieces and scenes to really give us murder mystery acting challenge like they apparently wanted to. And another thing I think that they tried to do maybe way too much of in this one was constantly make references and be referential even with the character names and how the queens were supposed to portray these characters. Characters. It just didn't leave a lot to the imagination, I think. And our top thespian tonight is Cheddar Gorgeous. Big surprise. But good God, three wins in a row, four total for this competition, by the way. And girl, no signs of slowing down. Remember, she said she's just now starting to feel competitive. I'm like, girl, the competition is yours if you want it at this point. It's her and Danny Beard at the top. Danny's got just one less win, and Black Peppa has one from episode one. Pixie won for the girls' group, and John Burr's none. We're kind of in an interesting situation where personality and talent-wise, I 
feel like this final five right now is really dynamic, interesting, and amazing. But competition wise, it just clearly feels like Cheddar or Danny will get the crown in the end. Maybe a double win this season? We know the fans love that. And concerning our bottom two, we do have a gaggy, shocking, <gasps> unexpected double save tonight. The writing was on the wall. It was very expected, actually. The untucked parts of the episode were giving us storyline development for these two, Black Peppa and John Burr's Blonde, and both of them were wearing outfits immediately deemed by Rue as iconic pieces of Drag Race history. And I agree with that. But that is to say, they were not going anywhere. But aside from the writing on the wall that there would be a double save, I will say the actual lip sync performance was phenomenal. Jombers and Peppa killed it, both of them from beginning to end. That was electric. I don't think I had really been on the edge of my seat that close to the edge in a while watching a lip sync. Like they both not just wanted to stay, but needed to stay. I felt that. Did you just say wig? That's just for us. And now let's briefly cover the drama for the week before we jump into our hottest hots. First, we've got Dakota's Tea Time with Tia Coffee to go through. And to be clear, this is Dakota Schiffer and Tia Coffee in the video, Tea Time, a YouTube show produced by the producers of the show that I have linked in the description of this video MLA format cited. Just a joke. And the title of this video I thought was really interesting. Dakota Schiffer, quote, didn't care Michelle Visage told her to sash away on Drag Race UK. Because you'll remember, she was eliminated on episode without Rue. So she really didn't get to say goodbye to Rue, which is kind of an iconic thing to do on the show. It is after all when you find out if RuPaul really likes you. Dakota said, I don't need it. And more interestingly, we got to get a little deeper into the mind of Dakota, which I really enjoyed. She talked about her insecurities and how she was, quote, gaslighting herself into believing she was not doing as well as how the fans, us, are perceiving her or perceived her progress in the competition. It's been so overwhelming and the response has been so lovely. And I think I felt so little while I was there and I really beat myself up about where I was against the other queens in the competition. And I gaslit myself on set to thinking I was the worst one every week, but to actually like feel like I did a good job in a lot of challenges. Oh, and here's a little clip of her talking about the sweater that she wore when she was in the workroom for the last time. The jumper uh, was knitted uh, by my twin. The reason why I was so upset leaving, I think was because I didn't get to wear that piece. I, every runway, I was just hoping it was the right my theme that that jumper was for. The first thing I did when I got into that workroom was I literally like looked at the producer and I went, please let me wear this jumper because otherwise I'm going to, you're going to have to drag me out kicking and screaming. Now onto the Drag Race UK apology that was issued earlier this week about a mix up of Baby and Black Peppa in one of their promotional videos where Dakota Schiffer was talking about some queens that she was closest with. This text on the screen here is from Digital Spy by Harriet Mitchell published November 8th. Links in the description of this video and engraved on my tombstone. It it reads, Drag Race UK has apologized after Baby called out an embarrassing mistake that happened on a farewell video to Dakota Schiffer following her elimination. In the video, which has now been deleted, Dakota listed Starlet, Baby, and Danny Beard as members of the cast she had grown closest to during her time on the show. When Dakota listed Baby's name in the video, a picture of Black Peppa appeared with Baby written underneath, which was posted to the BBC Three's Drag Race UK official Twitter page. Screenshot of that now deleted video here. And that really is the drama of what happened. We'll get to the apology in a second. It's a really, really tough mistake for them to make, especially considering that in the past, Drag Race UK queens of color like Tia Coffey, Taste, Asina Mandela, and Vanity Milan have spoken out about how queens of color from the Drag Race UK franchise are being confused with each other by the fan base. And I think this issue is a serious one worth highlighting and talking about again and again. Why is it consistently that queens of color are being mixed up when white queens are not? And of course, I do want to acknowledge that me, myself, being in the video editing and publishing industry mistakes do happen and things get overlooked but when something this serious comes out of the actual franchise's social media accounts it's like whoa y'all are not paying attention to what you're doing but i'm not here to shame them just ask questions and report the news their apology on twitter read we are so deeply sorry about an error that appeared on a bbc social video that was made to support rupaul's drag race uk we have sincerely apologized to both baby and black peppa and we also want to extend our heartfelt apologies to anyone else that this post offended as soon as the mistake was spotted the post in question was removed from all of our platforms. Once again, our sincerest apologies. And I genuinely hope for Baby and Black Peppa's sake that the franchise really did make it right to them on the back end. There was also some other interesting tea or input slash opinions provided under this tweet from Miss Willem. She wrote, 
pay them. Put your money where your mouth is. Words fall flat when you can say it with coins considering the girls go into debt just to compete on your shows and you give them effing pins slash badges. An account wrote underneath Willem's tweet, it's about time they give money for the girls to buy their outfits so no one goes into debt and a limit for how much you can spend so there's no more poor queen being out early because of their income and a rich queen being pushed. And Willem wrote to that, they do but it's not enough, like $2,500. And then a follow up tweet Willem wrote, they pay the girls 250 euro an episode for UK. In America, they're paid almost double that per episode, $500. 10 years ago when I filmed, I was paid 400 an episode. At World of Wonder makes millions per episode. And of course, if you have been a Bussy Queen subscriber for a while, you're aware of those euro and dollar sign numbers that the girls get paid per episode. I read through both participant agreements for US and UK a couple of years ago now. And provided the numbers that Willem is putting in here are current, it is again shocking to see that these girls are really getting paid dust to be on this show that can completely mentally, physically, and monetarily wreck them. So my final thoughts there, regardless of the issue that happened with the Drag Race UK socials, is that all the queens absolutely do need to be making way more money per episode. But I do question, would a huge budget for runways or putting some kind of cap or limit on them even really matter? Because as we have seen time and time again, runways are not 50% of the mark. They're not 40, not 30, not 20, not 10. They're like zero. It's all about the challenge. But let me know what y'all think about all of this in the comments down below. I also want to remind y'all, I turned on my channel memberships, which means you can click the join button next to subscribe to monetarily support this channel and get special membership perks. At the House of Transport tier, you'll get these cute flame icons next to your name, which serve as membership loyalty badges that change with time. And at the bus driver tier, you'll get your name in the description of my videos. Plus, new feature alert, all my channel members are going to be getting access to the bus stop. My brand new podcast I debuted on Patreon that talks about pop culture, includes guests, local drag queens from the Austin area, and more. Again, you can find the podcast by becoming a member of my channel or by joining my Patreon where you will get even more additional bonus content like reactions. Wow. Now finally, for Hottest Hots today, I hate that I have to pick a runway because the first four, Danny, Jombers, Cheddar, and Black Peppa, each one of them different and unique and beautiful and stunning and memorable in their own ways. But I will give it to Jombers. I, this was a phenomenal look. And in the challenge, I'm gonna give it to Danny Beard. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots, and this week they voted for Jombers Blonde on the runway and Cheddar Gorgeous in the challenge. See you later. Love ya. Bye. FYI, I'm not running for president. I'm walking. Hi, ugly. It's me, Pussy. And welcome back to Hot or Rat. And today, we're going to get political, political. We'll be reviewing episode nine of RuPaul's Drag Race UK season four, in which our queens were challenged to roast each other in a semi, quasi, kind of, not really political fashion. I think they just wanted a theme. Look over there. And the runway category was pretty and punk. Now, let's grab a rock and Brooklyn's new face and get this roast to cooking. First up, girls, gays, theys, and the fourth gender, Danny Beard. Or should I say the absence of gender? Because F gender. Right? Wait, who's gender? Danny's runway tonight is giving punk, anarchy, and the desecration of societal norms. I'm really enjoying that 80s hair band wig that she's got on. And I love the yellow tartan making up most of this outfit. I think the white and black tartan on the inside is a great contrast to all of that. It's a little Vivian Westwood, a little Pete Burns, and a lot of whatever the hell Danny woke up and felt like that day. This is a really fun, interesting, and I think visually stunning look with a great message. But I think for me and my personal taste, it's a little too many cooks in the kitchen. As you can see, I'm a much more modest woman of simpler upbringings and conservative fashions. But what works for me does not necessarily work for V. <laughs> Danny did herself in this style in a really maximalist way that was really fun to look at on the runway and for those reasons I'm going to give this look a hot. In the rose, Danny was selected by John Burrs and Peppa to open the show, which I think worked in Danny's favor a lot more than it did anyone else's. She was the star of the show, the reason for this season. In fact, her roast was so succulent everyone else's just tasted like chopped liver. She started off strong with a Liverpool library misdirect joke and immediately went in on those reads. Alan, Ollie the guest judge, Starlet, Peppa, I mean no one was safe. Except for John Burr's the entire season. And she could have come off too harsh, flinging insults left and right. But remember, it was a roast. And her delivery was perfect. She knew exactly how to time and pace the cadence of her jokes, leave pauses for laughter, and emphasize things in such a way while she was saying them that lets you know, okay, she's joking. She doesn't really have this, you know, hatred in her heart. She is just reading in the library and letting them have it. She ate, left no crumbs, destroyed the cookware, and burned the recipe. This performance was 
that. And this was, I think, a very important win for Danny to get at this point in the competition. We're coming off the back of three Cheddar Gorgeous wins. But this really was that victory lap win that I think Danny needed to clutch right before the finale to remind everyone why she's there and deserves the crown. She's now got repeater badges for the girl group challenge, the improv sketch, the rusical, and the roast. Next up, always a bridesmaid and never a bride. It's Jomper's Blonde. And on the runway tonight, the first person I thought of when I saw this look was pink. There was just something about the hair and I guess that feminine but punky way she was presenting on the runway. And I did like this look. It was interesting and Jompers is very good, I think, at keeping it interesting on the runway. You never know what she's gonna wear. But we've also seen that work against her a little bit as a double-edged sword. Like where or what is signature Jompers blonde in this look? I feel like any fashion model could put this on and present the garment and it would look fine. And not only did I want more Jompers from this look, I wanted more punk. It's almost too ballerina or ice skater or something trying to be edgy. I think even going bald for this look would have been a major improvement. So a bad look? No. But my flavor? Also no. I'm gonna give it a rot. And in the challenge, she was intoxicating. And more than anything, I think this challenge was a great redemption for the poor acting that she gave us in last week's Murder Mystery. Because what sold this performance to me more than the actual joke she told was this crazy drug character. She was being so over the top that there was this element of, ooh, what drama is gonna do next? She was having a great time up there, and that was the difference in this episode between a good and a bad roast. Because she definitely had some flat lines sprinkled throughout, like the hard joke in the beginning, but would then, for example, make up for that with, like, the gender revealed joke, which I can't say the other part of because of YouTube rules. And this very hot and cold delivery of jokes would have been bad, I think, if she wasn't playing a drunk character. But because of how she was acting, it did feel more like a part of the actual routine. Even if she probably actually did need to look at her notes because she couldn't remember the next thing that she was supposed to say, which, by the way, has not been looked favorably upon by the judges in previous roast challenges. But Jumpers got away with it. And of course, I think we have to acknowledge it really helps your set when the judges like you a lot. RuPaul Paul and Michelle have some positive heckling, I would say, when she's uh, missing some punchlines that allow her to safely segue into the next parts that are funnier. If there's one thing about that Jombers, it's that she's a good time. This performance was hot. I will say though, this did kind of break my heart to see Jombers go another episode where she's being told that she did a good job, but not a good a job enough to receive a win. Like she has proven she is good at so many things. Fashion, comedy, acting, dancing, and and lip syncing, yet she failed to get a single win. And zero challenge wins going into the finale isn't totally unheard of. We've seen off the top of my head, Ellie Diamonds do this in season two of Drag Race UK, but the zero wins does feel extra bad in this particular case because two of the queens entering the final four have four wins each. It hardly seems like a fair finale, but I suppose all's fair in war, love, and RuPaul's Drag Race, right? Next up, why y'all gagging so? She brings it to you every runway, it's Black Peppa. And she's wearing by far my favorite favorite interpretation of Pretty and Punk tonight. It feels very Grace Jones with those high shoulders. And of course, a little 90s cyberpunk. The hair is phenomenal. And this look really is about the details and silhouette that she has created here. The story is so elegant, masculine, feminine, everything in between, and also nothing in between. Hmm. Side note, I also love that this look was kind of reminiscent of early gender F RuPaul. Ru used to do all kinds of gender bendy, punky, mohawky types of styles back in the day. You know, before she went mainstream. This is really just a phenomenal statement piece of fashion here, and I have no other words. Look at her. This look is so hot. I can die. But in the roast. Well, she was toast. Burnt toast. Smell burnt toast, bitch. Geometrics roast lives rent free in my head. It tortures me every night. So Black Bub has had this narrative through line over the past couple of episodes about her not finding confidence in her ability to be funny, which is strange as we've discussed coming from the mouth of somebody who is so quick witted, always funny in exchanges with other queens in the workroom and has these elements that RuPaul has pointed out several different times of whimsicality throughout her fashion. And this self doubt in her comedy is also strange to hear because because I see Black Peppa as a very confident person. I mean, the way she walks the runway, oh my God, and the way she performs in the many lip syncs that she's lip synced in. And the other layer of irony wrapping up this storyline of Black Peppa not feeling confident in her ability to be funny is that she actually came across very confident while she was doing the roast. For example, she has this opening joke about being late to arrive at the competition because of some regional highway traffic over there, and everyone just kind of blank stares her. But she stood there, looked everyone in the eye, and said, just laugh. 
off. And they did. But it was clear that these self-aware moments were much funnier than the jokes that she was telling were intended to be. So was she successful at the actual roast? No. I took one bite and <laughs> I was stuffed. This was a rat. Also, side note, I really enjoyed her random size when she would go through her jokes list. It really brought me back to pheromone. Oh, oh, where is she? I miss her. Oh, and real quick, I just want to remind y'all the bus stop, my brand new podcast has gone public. That's right. Grab your bus pass and click the link in the description of my video to listen to the first episodes on my new podcast YouTube channel, The Bus Stop. Beep beep. Next up, Pixie, not so polite, who's brought everything but the kitchen sink to the runway tonight. Or maybe it is under there. Let's say something polite first. What I like about this look is Pixie gave it her all. Every last piece of fabric in the fabric store and the one next door. And she certainly did choose a color pattern red, white, and blue. Why? I don't know. But she chose it. And if that isn't punk, then I don't know what is. And that was sarcasm. I'm not really sure what's going on with Pixie here tonight on the runway. I think she just kind of misunderstood the assignment or was given a completely different assignment. It's very, I woke up in the hotel bed, wrapped the duvet cover and the curtains around myself and went to go answer the door for room service type of vibes. She's even got a little business in the front party in the back situation happening with her hair. There's just no real silhouette, pattern, rhyme, or reason to any part of this look that I could find. And so for those reasons, I am going to give this look a rat. But is it punk? I don't know. Who's to say? Who's to say what is or is not punk? Because Pixie's art pop could mean anything. And in the roasty toasty challenge, Miss Pixie really took this seriously tonight. She heard politics and she said, I'm going to get on that stage and give a debate. Like that is the energy that she brought to her jokes. And that's the reason they were unsuccessful. And at first I thought, oh, this will be a good bit. She's doing, you know, serious conservative politician woman making silly drag queen jokes. But it never evolved beyond that. Like there were no layers. There was no winking. There was no nudging. First joke was good though. When she said, politicians are liars and that she was happy to be in front of such a talented panel of queens. And this style of delivery is the risk you run when you're doing a roast and insulting the people in the audience. If you don't give the caddy reads the attention and careful, playful energy that they need, they are going to burn. This was a and the other thing I noticed was this overtone of seriousness that she put into this character in the roast. We've seen this before. This was the same type of thing I think that was going on last week in the acting challenge and the same type of energy that she brought to Dame Shirley Bassey in Snatch Game. And I think Pixie actually is quite funny. I mean, remember she won the reading challenge and she's very congenial and makes me laugh when she's in confessionals. But those were also instances where she was way more relaxed and not laser focused on the competition. I think maybe obsessing over winning or something. Thing. She got in her head again and again and again. And you know, that happens to the best of us. And finally, she invented counterculture, sliced it and served it on the runway tonight. It's cheddar gorgeous. I'm seeing double. This look was a great compliment to Black Peppa's punk look, I think. Because when I personally hear the word punk, I am thinking about styles more like these. And I mean, come on, who could get tired of these giant spiky hairs? Willow Pill's impact. And I like Cheddar's Pretty and Punk take because it felt like a more realer type of fashion for Cheddar. She normally is going for this extremely otherworldly alien deity thing. And this was a little more pared down, a little more real salt of the earth punk. Like the good old days. None of this TikTok. Talk BS. This look is hot. But over in the challenge, Miss Cheddar Gorgeous got in her spaceship, flew up into the stratosphere, and crash landed here on Earth. Debris were everywhere. And I'll admit, I was kind of enjoying seeing her stumble for the first time in this competition. You know, it showed she might be human after all. But it was also fun to see a chink in her armor, I think as Michelle put it, because we knew she wasn't going home. We could just kind of laugh at, oh, ha, you're funny, but not this time. There was no risk involved. Wow, me enjoying a contestant doing bad in a challenge. Is it me? Am I the drama? Yes, every week on twitter.com slash bussyqueen. Thank God that hellhole is being burnt to the ground. Anyways, let's break it down. So Cheddar actually asks Peppa in Jombers, who set the order of the roast, not to put her as last. She's talking about how she thinks her set and humor is going to be too dry, kind of like your and that being last in a roast, this dry humor is not going to land. I don't really understand that logic there because I don't think this set in any position of this roast would have been funny. Like what's dryness got to do? got to do with it. She chooses to do the classic politicians are actually lizard people in skin suits bit, which is actually funny commentary in itself. The Curl Show actually did a bit on this in one of the publicity episodes, which is one of my personal favorites. Did you see that? And it could have been successful if she were actually telling jokes. Where were the jokes? This was a 
Right now for the bottom two tonight. No surprise. We've got Black Peppa and Pixie Polite. I do think Cheddar maybe could have been swapped out for Pixie. If maybe you wanted to argue that Pixie did objectively give a better roast than Cheddar did. But I'll leave that discussion up to y'all in the comments of this video. Do you think that following the guidelines of a roast and actually writing jokes and telling them, even if they're not funny, should have been safe over doing your own thing, theatrical monologue thing? It's not my show. But either way, as I was hinting at, my thoughts are that the producers were never going to risk actually putting Cheddar into the bottom no matter what happened this episode. Like to even risk having a front runner like Cheddar go home at this point would have just been, girl, cancel the show now. Anyways, Peppa, no surprise, destroys the lip sync. Girl, this is her fourth time in the bottom and she gets better every time. Like a fine wine gets better with age. And I did react to this lip sync as well as the best parts of this episode over on my Patreon at patreon.com slash queen. That's my members only website where you can join to support the channel and get exclusive member benefits and you can join by clicking the link in the description of this video. See you there! But in 100% honesty and truth, this lip sync win was 100% earned and deserved by Black Peppa. Pixie kind of gave up, I think, before it even started. She was very defeated in her head and then she starts struggling with her outfit and then they make a big deal of her tripping during the lip sync and, you know, it just, it was not going her way and I don't think it was going to. But as you want to highlight, I think Pixie did a great job throughout this competition and sure, I think her inner saboteur did get in the way of some of her best qualities. But y'all know how RuPaul's Drag Race is these days. Losing is the new winning. And just because you're fifth out on season four of UK doesn't mean you can't join UK All Stars or one of the Versus of the World seasons and absolutely dominate. So I do genuinely hope that Pixie can figure out what got in her way this time around and give us a better run next time. And the winner of the roast, duh, Danny Beard. She's proven basically every episode that she has got it all. Charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. And a beard. <laughs> And finally, as for my hottest hots, I'm gonna give it to Daddy Beard in the challenge and Black Peppa on the runway. I also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots and this week they voted for Daddy Beard in the challenge and Black Peppa on the runway. Also, don't forget to check out my brand new podcast, The Bus Stop, which is also linked in the description. See y'all later, love ya, bye. Shrug emoji, send tweet, Siri, send tweet, send it, send it. <laughs> Hi, Ugly. It's me, Bussy, and welcome back to Hot or Rot. And today, we are reviewing the finale of RuPaul's Drag Race UK Season 4. It's finally here! Today, our final four were challenged to remix a RuPaul Mega Mix with their own lyrics and perform some pretty intense choreography in a grand finale performance. And on the runway, almost all of our UK Season 4 queens returned to the runway one last time to present their grand finale extravaganza Boots the House Down Yes God Oh drag. Plus, there was oodles and noodles of drama. After the finale, Baby was seen on Twitter talking a little bit about why she wasn't there and discusses no longer identifying as a drag queen. Crystal Versace was calling out for allegedly copying Is She Hungry's makeup. Just May addressed her haters, which is to say we've got a lot to cover today in the arena of Drag Race UK. Now, let's crown a winner, baby. First up, hots all around to our returning cast of UK season four. Everybody really looked phenomenal in their finale eleganza extravaganza runways. And Starlet looking like Cinderella? That goofy little girl. I missed her. Seriously though, the way every single queen looks so incredible. It just goes to show how seriously this cast took this season and how much talent there was. I also thought it was great that the entire cast got to have cameos in the main finale mega mix performance. These queens put a lot on the line to compete on RuPaul's Drag Race, mentally, physically, emotionally, and I just really want to give some love to everybody and to remind you all to go give them some love for being on screens one last time. Now onto our final four in the order they performed. First up, we've got the seasoning of the season, Black Peppa, who had such an excellent elimination defying run this season. She was the lip sync assassin time after time. And every time I saw her going into the bottom, I was like, I don't want to see her go, but I love to watch her do her best to stay. But it wasn't just the lip sync that kept me addicted to Black Peppa. It was her uniqueness, nerve, charisma, and talent that really drew me to to her. She's someone who radiates confidence and has the chops to back it up. And let's not forget the runways, the headpiece queen of the season. And y'all know I've been a Black Peppa stan since the beginning of the season. But what she did tonight in the challenge was, I think, an excellent capstone on her entire drag race run. She sang, let's go, let's start it up, check it out, watch this, a bad gal rhythm with a Caribbean twist. Latex, baby, taste this leather. Everybody's salty, but I'm just Peppa. And I know me reading those lyrics are not gonna do what she did in that verse justice, but she 
gave a galvanized energetic like delivery of these lyrics that was so fresh for her and so recharged and I really appreciated it because even as she acknowledges in her lyrics she did have so many soft spoken moments where I think she struggled to find her voice or confidence specifically in comedy challenges but this verse was a beautiful reflection on that to say that was me but look at me now but it wasn't just her lyrics telling the story of who she started this competition as and who she is now but also the way that she absolutely killed the choreo she reminded us with every drop and every bop that she was lip sync assassin of the season and y'all are not gonna forget it there was part of the episode in untucked when lauren cheney was telling the final four that they need to remember they're fabulous but not beyonce and black Pepper just looks at her and she's like but i think i'm beyonce and this performance backed that statement up black peppa belongs on a stage if that's what she wants for the rest of her life this performance was hot but girl another place that she is absolutely at home at 24 7 the mother tuck and runway look at this this gown is a gorgeous homage to fashion her personal brand of fashion she's wearing a tattered deconstructed racer flag that has been turned into a gown that's kind of motocross but also 100 glamazon i just know rupaul was so proud watching black peppa in this look also want to acknowledge i think she did something extra special with her makeup tonight it was so fierce this is a top shelf spice cabinet look here from black peppa this look is so hot next up grab a slice it's cheddar gorgeous and this is a queen who has really proven that she can and has and will continue to do it all acting comedy professionalism history lessons dr cheddar gorgeous is in the house and what i'll remember most from cheddar throughout this season is her gorgeous take on art drag and life as a whole she loves love and loves people and i think she's made all of that very clear through specifically the presentation of her runways this season we saw the pansy project and pink triangle runways really as a testament to I think her great appreciation for people plus for as serious as she is and takes so many things she's also funny as hell let's not forget she won snatch game and in tonight's challenge she acknowledges all that right off the bat singing it's me cheddar gorgeous OG queen of versatility leave your doubt behind you believe you can be more learn to love the alien throw the rule book out the door and if those lyrics were not an exact testament to literally everything that I just said about her oh my god unique always different never the same same, she's that girl. Her lyrics, I think, were as beautiful as she is and true to her drag as they could possibly have been. And she did sing them, which I think made them feel a bit short in comparison to some of the quicker paced lyrics tonight, but the greater impact was still there. And the only critique that I had on her performance in this mega mix was the choreo was not as maybe exciting as someone who was dancing the house down boots like Black Peppa. In Shutter's performance specifically, she kept going back to this kind of Macarena style dance thing that was happening. And I was like, okay, hey, Macarena, yeah. I think we all kind of knew though, going into this challenge that high energy dance track style performance is not necessarily Cheddar's forte, but I think she did a great job, all things considered. This absolutely gets a hot from me. On the runway though, oh my God, she takes us to infinity and beyond. This is a next level a and deity goddess look from Cheddar Gorgeous. This is, I think, the perfect capstone of runway looks that she could have delivered tonight. She looks like a walking, living, breathing, celestial body come from outer space to grace us with her presence and share the knowledge of the future with us. I also love the like salad finger fingers that she had on. <laughs> Rusty spoons, anyone? The feeling of rest against my salad fingers. This look is the perfect encapsulation of Cheddar Gorgeous's attention to detail in every single thing that she does. Everywhere you look, there's a beat, there's a stone, there's a perfectly paid attention to piece of fabric that is rouged or stitched in a way that accentuates her body and creates a gorgeous silhouette. This is absolutely phenomenal. Forget a slice, I want the whole block of this cheddar. This look is Next up, she's got a beard, but nothing to hide. It's Danny Beard. And Michelle made a comment about Danny tonight that I think was the best compliment you could really give a performer like Danny, and that was she would watch Danny Beard perform the phone book. Yeah, I, I mean, I would too. The talent in Charisma, Uniqueness, Nerve, and Talent is, I think, perfectly exemplified by this person, Danny Beard. And her highlights to me from this season were when she was front and center on stage in the Rusical, and also, of course, last week's Roast. She's the queen you want 
headlining your gigs, working the mic, talking to the audience, and entertaining the people. And in tonight's challenge, she said, Look at me, girl, I'm phenomenal. I'll grab her style and abdominals. Get you laughing so hard all over these hoes. These queens going down like dominoes. And I think what I love most about Danny's verse tonight was how much fun she had, which again, I think is me highlighting how much she truly loves performing. It shines through no matter what she's doing. Her performance is funny and lighthearted. I was laughing and enjoying every second of it. Plus, I love that classic tearaway reveal thing she did during her performance, which is just so stupid. There's no reason to tear off this much of a skirt to reveal nothing special underneath, but she did it and that's why it's funny. The one critique I have for Danny's performance is the same thing I was thinking about Cheddar's. Seeing these two dance after watching Black Puppet dance, and you're like, wow, okay, some people really are dancers and some are also dancers, but they're not Beyonce. <laughs> Love what she did though, this performance was high. And on the runway, she's a lively liverbird, which by the way is a symbol of her hometown Liverpool. And I think it's really cool that she is doing an homage to her hometown Liverpool in this finale runway. She's a golden phoenix rising from the ashes. And I love the top part of this look so much that hair and makeup is top tier untouchable. It is perfectly sculpted perfectly everything. It's giving me like Blade Runner replicant vibes, but with that touch of club kid aesthetic that is so unique to Danny Beard. The rest of the look though, I think is just a hair, or I guess I should say feather, under Danny reaching a new height on the runway, but only because that black cocktail dress that she is wearing beneath all of the gorgeous gold featherings with all that amazing texture is so plain in contrast. Has she found a way to, I think, incorporate some of the intricate detailing in the golden feather part of the look to the base of the outfit and on the shoes as well, this could have been taken to new heights. I think really though, she's only a victim of her prior success on the runway here because she has delivered so much cohesive, unique, club kid, interesting things on the runway that have left us gagging and begging for more. God, don't shave this queen. This look is hot. Next up, JB's in the house. No, not Justin Bieber, John Burr's blonde. <laughs> That was stupid. I don't know why I said that. I was dying at the judges talking about how they basically did not expect her to be in the finale when they first saw her walk into the workroom. I think it was Graham who even said he would have placed a 100 to 1 bet on her being in the finale. And you know, even I remember from day one of the cast reveal thinking, I don't know what the hell to expect from this queen. She seems like such a wild card. And hey, as it turns out, that is a great trick to have up your sleeve. JB every single week kept us as audience members and the judges guessing. And she excelled in so many different areas. Snatch game, the rusical, runways, even the roast. I mean, she was there at the top, but failed to secure wins so many times. And that made me a little sad every single week to watch her be so close to a Rue Peter badge, but never get to taste it. But despite all of that, she kept a great attitude throughout the competition, rolled with the punches, took the critiques, and elevated her drag to new and different heights with every successive episode. She was a fierce competitor to the very end, and tonight in the challenge was no exception. She sang, strut to the beat, compose with me. This bird is flying high, shouting cooey. A great acknowledgement to her musical bird performance, by the way. People say blondes have more fun, so bleach it up. Make it fashion, hun. And if I haven't already, then let me say, I'm Northern Irish, babe, it's your lucky gay. And I think honestly, JB gave a really underrated lyrical delivery and performance here tonight. She wasn't just hitting her Marks, doing tough choreo, getting picked up by the dancers, and lip syncing every single one of her words perfectly. But she did it in very obvious control of everything she was doing. This was her Britney moment, and I say, give me, give me more. Plus, I want to commend her lyric writing here. It was a lot better than, I think, her first lyrics that we saw from her in the girl group challenge. She's Northern Irish, babe. It's your lucky gay. This was hot. <laughs> Plus, JB had another phenomenal runway tonight. This was reminiscent of, I think, the styling heights that she reached on her Ruffles runway two weeks ago. I absolutely love the gorgeous gold bent metal shield that she's carrying down the runway. As she says, giving an homage to Scaparelli fashion. On someone so soft, Soft and pretty and charismatic is JB, I think this contrast of hardness and softness is a really, really beautiful place to be for her. And all I'm trying to say is that I think she looks phenomenal. She was somebody
somebody who struggled a little bit, I think, to really put her stamp on what exactly JB represents in drag. But on the other hand, it was that versatility and again, unexpected wildcard element that she has that I think ultimately allowed her to succeed in the way she did. If she wasn't experimenting every single week with something different, I don't think she would have been able to get the critiques that ultimately allowed her to improve and become a better contestant. I can only imagine where she'll take this newfound power in drag. JB, this look is so our final four queens absolutely killed it in the challenge and on the runway tonight. And when it all comes down to it, RuPaul makes the final decision to let only two queens enter the true finale, the final lip sync. And big surprise, he chooses Cheddar Gorgeous and Danny Beard. Neither of them were ever in the bottom and they each entered the finale with four wins. This episode was a simple victory lap intended for one of them to ultimately take the crown home. And I did react to this lip sync as well as the best part of this finale over on my Patreon. That's my members only website where my patron family gets exclusive member benefits like early access to my YouTube videos, access to exclusive videos and access to the Bussy Queen Discord server. And you can join by clicking the link in the description of my video. See you there. But as correct as I think that decision Rue made was, was, I will say I was surprised with the ultimate outcome. And to use a cliche, I did not have a dog in this fight. I would have been thrilled to have seen the crown go to Danny or Cheddar. I think there has never been a drag race competition this close. If Rue had given them both a crown, I would have been happy. I think the fan base would have been happy. I think they would have been happy. And I think that was evident even in how happy they were for each other when they saw who ultimately did win. But I was surprised when Danny was called as the winner because the storytelling throughout the season almost felt like we had this narrative shift to Cheddar that was so strong throughout the middle chunk of the season that was like, okay, obviously they're gonna give the crown to Cheddar. Then the last minute, we have Danny Beard winning the roast. And then we've got this finale. It was just neck and neck. I do think Cheddar had a slight, just a hair above Danny there. Her performance was slightly more dynamic and I think interesting because we got to see this crazy alien look she was wearing come apart. And each time she would take off one of the pieces, like the gloves with the crazy fingers, you would see that she actually had more details to the look underneath each piece. There was gold foil on the hands. There was makeup scale shading on her legs. And for someone who I've given the critique of maybe not being the strongest dancer, she absolutely makes up for that in performance ability. The theatrics she was giving in this lip sync were phenomenal as were Danny's. Both of them did amazingly. And I'm so happy for the winner, Danny Beard. But yeah, maybe, maybe this should have been a double crowning. I don't know. Let me know what y'all think down in the comments below. Finally though, before we jump into the drama of this finale and talk about our hottest hots from the episode, I just want to one more time say congratulations to everyone in this season and give an extra special congratulations to Danny Beard, our newly crowned queen of the UK. And may her reign be fortunate, long, and hairy. Now, onto the drama. First, let's talk about Baby. Oh my god. I missed her last week and this week. I know she would have killed that performance. But yeah, she wasn't there. And people were noticing that online. Someone tweeted out where TF was Baby in the finale. And she tweeted, don't ask questions you don't want the answers to. The sparkle emoji. And then later that evening, she tweeted this out. Don't refer to me as a drag queen anymore. A Twitter user then responded to her writing, out of interest given, we've just seen you compete on Drag Race and seen your love for drag, what has changed in this regard? I'm catching a tone of resentment towards the term drag queen. And Baby responded, no resentment at all. I just don't think it's a term that's applicable to me anymore. I'm a non-binary performer slash creative, but I wouldn't call it drag. And another Twitter asked her, are you quitting drag? To which she responded, I'll still be performing, etc. if that's what you mean. No, what I meant was like, have you stopped doing full-time drag or do you still do the drag and taking a break? XXX. And Baby said, I'll be performing slash working full-time as I have been for many years, ha. Makeup, a wig, and a look doesn't mean I'm doing drag, ha. And so far as of when I'm making this video, that's all Baby has chosen to share with everybody publicly. The important takeaway being, I think she is going to continue performing, so don't expect her to not be on any show rosters or anything. But I think she is expressing a sentiment that is maybe more common in the UK. We've seen Bimini kind of take a departure from calling herself a drag queen. But all we can really do here in this situation is respect her wishes. That's why Baby wasn't in the last two 
two episodes though, I think the answer is fairly obvious. She stepped away from the show to take care of herself and her mental health, and I think continuing to be on the show would have been antithetical to why she stepped away in the first place. Just speculation though, just speculation, gossip, and drama from the Gossip Queen. We also saw an interesting dramatic tweet from JB after the finale who wrote, I wonder if you'll hear what happened after the crowning and the truth of what happened. To which Cheryl Hole replied, writing, Jomber's keeping us on the edge of seat with drama even when the last episode aired. Spill the tea, gal. To which Jomber's ultimately replied, writing, wasn't anything to do with the gals, just another day in the office of having a funny accent. And there doesn't seem to be more information on this either. This felt very Tia Coffee and Priyanka Twitter feud that they had a couple of weeks ago. Fake to rile up the fans and get people talking. And honestly, who doesn't love a little fake drama? There was a little bit of real drama that came from this finale though. Christopher Sachi had a little bit of a back and forth on Twitter with Hungry, or Is She Hungry, as you might know her by if you've seen her handles across her platforms. And it started with Hungry calling out Crystal on Twitter, writing, when you spill a little ink, when you buy it at Versace, which featured a video clip showing some makeup that Hungry had done on a model right next to the makeup that Crystal did for her finale return look in this episode. And if you followed Hungry over the years, she is undeniably a talented makeup artist who, yes, this style of makeup, I would say probably originated with her. This also though isn't the first time that Hungry has called out other people doing makeup in her style or similar to her style. After the call out, Hungry tweeted this, she barely got two lines in, but then again, it's probably hard to open one's mouth with someone else's stretched across your own. Strug emoji, send tweet series, send tweet, tweet it, send, send. And Crystal has responded just once as of when I'm making this video to this feud, writing to Is She Hungry, if only you could walk properly with this video of Hungry walking a runway. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> And of course, as the Twitter stands do, this situation got a little bit out of hand. Crystal was being called nasty names on Twitter and Cornbread jumped to her defense writing this. I frankly don't give a damn about the Crystal vs. Miss Hungry situation, but y'all not to sit here and say Crystal, transphobic, and racist. We know each other very well and we not about to pull that. All y'all messy ass stands, please pipe down. Ain't got to do with y'all. And don't comment opinions on the debate they are having. I'ma just click block. Don't care to discuss it. And that's that. We also got some tweets from just May, who tweeted this out after the finale. You all need to get effed. Quote, Michelle's face when she walked out. Quote, it was so ill-fitted. Quote, she only does one face. When you get behind the panel, you get to judge me. Until then, just keep your opinions to yourself. You really know how to spoil a beautiful end to something. And followed that up with, for the record, I loved my look. I thought I looked beautiful. I think she really did look great here. This really actually was a beautiful end to just May's time on Drag Race. You look great, May. Ignore the trolls. There's a troll, troll on the Twitter platform. And finally, the moment you've all been waiting for, our hottest hots. In the performance, I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Black Peppa. And on the runway tonight, Cheddar Gorgeous. And I, of course, also asked my patrons to vote on their hottest hots and they're in agreement with me, Black Peppa for the challenge and Cheddar Gorgeous for the runway. But I'd love to know what y'all are thinking about this finale's challenge and runway and even some of the drama we discussed down in the comments below. I also wanna say thanks to you for watching today's video and being with me here throughout Drag Race UK for to review it and hot or rot every single challenge and runway look. It's been a great time. See y'all later. Love ya. Bye.